I'm not sure if this is the right place to tell my story. I'm not sure if there is a right place. Maybe that's why I waited so long. Maybe that's just an excuse. Maybe I'm just scared. I worked for the National Park Service for three years. I wasn't out in the trees though. Unfortunately, my story isn't going to be that exciting. My official title was Administrative Specialist. I helped organize government-funded programs and prepared written documents related to those programs. I was good at my job. I was fired unceremoniously 15 months ago. I wish I could say that my removal from the service was a mystery. I know exactly why they let me go. I saw too much. 12,307. Even though I know it's higher now, that's the number I remember. I couldn't scrub it from my brain if I tried. For eight months, the Science and Research Division of the Park Service was collaborating with an independent study group. I handled the paperwork for this partnership almost exclusively. Waivers, NDAs, and population registries for the fauna in our country's national parks. There were some odd additions for sure. Why were the members of the Park Service signing liability waivers? Asking those questions wasn't my job. I didn't know enough about the science and research division to begin a debate with them either. I trusted that the Park Service knew what they were doing and tried not to get hung up on the details. Then the injuries began. I'm not sure when they started or how many people were hurt before I became aware of it. The first few incidents, I now know, only involved the study group that I mentioned before. Without members of the Park Service involved, I had no reason to be notified. When the first ranger returned from the Everglades with a broken leg, I started paying attention. The ranger was part of a team documenting the population growth of the Virginia possum. I'd never heard of a possum breaking someone's leg. I had to file the details of the incident along with an insurance claim and a copy of the liability waiver signed by the ranger in question. That's how I knew the doctor had cited the source of the ranger's injury as an animal attack. That's how I saw the pictures. The ranger was mauled. When I started asking questions, I was only reminded of their official position, documenting the population growth of the Virginia possum. There were three more attacks over those eight months. I knew by then not to announce my suspicions. Whatever was going on in our parks, no one wanted to talk about it. Instead, I stuck to the documents. When the research project concluded, it was time to bid our independent partners farewell. I had to provide them with the original copies of every recorded incident related to the research. I did exactly as I was told. I prepared the pile of paperwork, and when I was asked to combine it with the folders brought into the office by the independent regime, I didn't hesitate. But I couldn't stop myself from peeking at their information either. The corner of one specific document was protruding from the edge of an unlabeled black folder. It must have come loose from the paperclip holding the rest of the folder's contents together. I tugged it along until I could read the heading, Unidentified Species. I remember how cold I felt when I read those words. The sweat on my brow turned to ice. I didn't know that the park district was involved with anything involving new or unusual forms of wildlife. I pulled on the paper a little more. Information spilled out of the folder, one line at a time. New encounters. Seven. There was a range of dates alongside that number. Those seven new encounters had taken place over the research period that I was involved in. Injuries. Nine. The park district only had four documented injuries. The other five, I expect, belonged to the independent company. Why had they kept that secret? Where were those injured parties? Total encounters, 12,307. My heart sank. There wasn't a range of dates next to that line. 
I didn't know how long this company had been studying the unidentified species in our jurisdiction. Had the Park Service been involved from the beginning? Why weren't these encounters, these injuries, or these new species being discussed with the community at large? I lost my composure after that. All discreet intentions vanished. I opened the folder where it sat. My eyes briefly passed over a collection of photographs. They looked to be screenshots from trail cams. One of them was a Polaroid. In each picture was a shape that I didn't recognize. Animals for sure. Mammals mostly. They were either moving too fast in the photos or my glance at them was too brief. But I couldn't decipher any of those species. A hand suddenly slammed the folder shut. It was a member of our science and research team. When they spoke, they did so in a hushed panic. They told me to forget what I saw, and it urged me away from the area. I later saw them handing the folder and my paperwork to a member of the independent party. They were scared when they caught me. I doubt that they were worried solely about my safety. I think the knowledge I gained at that moment could have put the entire park district at risk. That's what's so frightening. What could they do to us? A government body who has superiority over the park districts in the park that we manage. My termination arrived swiftly after that. I expected it to be accompanied by an NDA, but there wasn't one there. I guess the administrative specialists they had got to replace me overlooked that detail. I can't be punished for sharing this information now, can I? I now know that these parks are dangerous. They have been for years. But am I in danger too? I remember the night vividly. It was damp and brisk. We had just had a rainstorm, but it was one of those summer rainstorms that made everything warm, but cold. You know, the types where the wind is what makes you shiver. I had been called out to look for a dog that was roaming the neighborhood near a cemetery. The cemetery wasn't big, it was actually pretty small. But the dog had been scaring some of the people in the area. I was part of an animal control team. We had plenty of experience with handling stray dogs, so it wasn't an unusual call. The only thing that seemed odd was that the people said the dog was extremely massive. So to me, this sounded more like a wolf than a dog, but we really can't make any assumptions. We were told to go locate the dog and bring it into custody. I hadn't been to the area before. It was a strange town that was very remote, but it was still a type of suburban area. I could definitely see why a large canine would be threatening to the people there, but I still had my suspicions that we were looking for something that was not a domesticated dog. My partner and I drove around the town. There were lots of small shops. Most of them seemed to be family owned. There were a couple of candy shops, an ice cream shop, and some pizza, things like that. Truthfully, it was making me hungry. So I wanted to find this animal quickly so we could finally get some dinner. I remember telling myself, I'll have to remember this place. I'd really like to take a stroll down here on one of my days off. We didn't find the canine near the shops, so we started combing the neighborhood close to it. It was hard to see much. Many of the homes had plenty of bushes and trees. I wouldn't doubt it if we had been in the same vicinity as the hound. We just couldn't spot it. So we drove back and forth up and down those streets. We had spent at least an hour and a half doing this. We were starting to get a bit frustrated. That's when we got a lucky break. One of the people in the neighborhood must have seen us driving their streets aimlessly. So they flagged us down. The man said that they had seen the hound roaming near the cemetery on the south side. I asked the man how big the dog was. He said that it was extremely large, 
that its fur was pitch black and that they noticed its eyes were glowing like a deer's caught in the headlights of your car. We thanked the man and proceeded to drive towards the cemetery. The cemetery was very small, but it had plenty of large trees and bushes, just like the neighborhood had. It was getting darker, so things were made more difficult. It wasn't normal to do this, but my partner and I decided that we might have a better chance finding it on foot. This way, we'd be able to scavenge around the bushes and trees and use our flashlights. We were both nervous. If the canine was as big as everyone said it was, we wouldn't be very safe out in the open. And if it was, in fact, a wolf like I had thought, we wouldn't be in a very good position with it. So we stayed close to each other, and I did bring some things to our defense. Whistles and things like that. We circled around the outskirts of the cemetery first. We just needed to get a good look around the perimeter before we went straight into it. We didn't see anything at first. We just assumed it might have left the area. But then, as soon as we start to head back around, we see a black mass sitting in the middle of one of the streets between the neighborhood and the cemetery. And all I could smell was that fragrant burnt smell of an old campfire. I yelled to my colleague, but I kept front facing the canine. I didn't want to take my eyes off of it. At first glance, the dark mass seemed to be average sized, but as I continued to examine it, I noticed that the canine was actually laying flush to the ground. It wasn't standing. My colleague asks if I think it's a dog. I told them I wasn't sure that it was still a bit too far for me to make a proper estimation on the size of the animal. That's when the mass stands, and it was indisputably large. Its eyes are glowing, just as the man said, and it walks slowly away to the neighborhood and disappears. It walked like we were not any type of threat whatsoever. It was smart, this animal so we had to be extra careful. We followed the animal's path into the neighborhood. We looked around. We didn't see it, but what we did find was a strange black smudge. It was very large in size, and it appeared to be the spot where the hound was sitting. It smelt like charred wood, but there was no sign of the animal. It was getting really late. We were exhausted and hungry but we knew we had to get the animal off the streets. But after following an animal that seemed to simply vanish from our sight, it seemed like we needed more eyes. We made our way back to the van and I called for more assistance. We had another team meet us and we searched more. I had described the animal to the other team. They looked confused, but they didn't suggest that we had been fabricating anything. We reached well into the next day, without ever finding another trace of the hound. Eventually, my boss called and said it was time to leave the area, that the animal must have moved to a new territory. We were never called back to find the animal, so I often wonder, what ever happened to it? After college, I got a temporary administrative job working with the local law enforcement. It was a six-month contract and paid well, so I was glad to get it. I found a furnished apartment that let me rent month to month. It was on the top floor of a three-story building. It was pretty big and had nice hardwood floors. The walls were kind of thin and I could hear my neighbor sometimes, especially at night when it was quiet. When I first moved in, I knocked on the neighbor's door a few times to introduce myself, but they never answered, even though I thought I had heard them inside. I figured they didn't like answering the door if they weren't expecting somebody. Anyway, I just slipped a note under the door saying hello and giving my name. I worked with the same officers all the time on rotating shifts. After I'd been there a few weeks, 
I was on the evening shift, which meant I got to go home around 2 a.m. One night I was heading down the hallway of my building and saw a light from under my neighbor's door, and I saw the shadow of feet under the door. It looked like the people had gone dark, as if they heard me and were looking to see who was in the hall. I figured if they wanted to say hello, they would have opened the door. So I kind of waved and went into my apartment. Over the next couple of weeks, this happened three to four times. It seemed like I had a reclusive but nosy neighbor. One night after work, I got into bed and heard my neighbor moving around in their room on the other side of my bedroom wall. The noises got louder and I started getting worried. They'd never been that loud and it almost sounded like they were being attacked or having a heart attack and knocking things over. I ran out and banged on their door, but they didn't answer. I called out saying I was worried, and if they didn't answer, I'd call for help. Still, no answer. I ran to my apartment and called the police station and asked my coworker to send someone over. I'd headed down to the lobby to wait for the officer who showed up within five minutes. I'd gotten to know him a bit, and we went up and knocked on the door, but still no answer. I took him into my apartment, and we could still hear the loud thumps every five to ten seconds, and then a huge bang. The officer asked if I could contact the building manager to open the door. I called her up. Luckily, she was a night owl and was up watching TV. I told her what was happening, and she said she'd head over. She lived close by. She got there and asked which apartment it was. I told her 306. She looked at me weirdly and said 306 was empty. I said I heard my neighbor making noise almost every night. The officer said he had heard the noises too and asked if 306 was the apartment that was above the carport. She said it was. He said someone could have climbed onto the carports and maybe there were squatters in an empty apartment. The manager unlocked the door. The apartment was dark and she turned on the light. The officer went into the bedroom and came back saying it was empty. The place was spotless. All but two of the windows were locked and there was no sign of squatters. We stood there, confused. The officer said, you're not crazy. I heard the banging too. I said maybe we scared them off and they'd left through the unlocked windows. We locked the two windows and on our way out, I looked down and saw the note I had slipped under the door a few weeks earlier. I said I'd let them know if the noises kept up a few weeks later, when I was on the evening shift again, I got home about 2 a.m. and saw the light under the door of 306. I went into my bedroom and heard the thumping next door. I called for an officer to come out and called my building manager. A different officer showed up, and I knew him too. The manager arrived and unlocked the door. The officer went in, and everything checked out. The windows were all locked. I apologized and tried to rationalize it, but there was definitely no good explanation. A few weeks later, the apartment was rented out and I got the chance to meet my new neighbors. I told them to keep an eye out because we thought maybe squatters had been getting in. I've told them what had been happening. My last week there, the station had a barbecue and we were talking about the squatters that no one ever saw. I told the officer about the second call out and how all the windows were locked that time, but I knew I'd seen the light on and heard thumping. He asked if I wanted to hear something strange. He said he was going to tell me earlier, but didn't want to freak me out. He said that three months before I moved in, he personally responded to a call to my neighbor's apartment for a suicide. The person had hung himself and was unconscious. It seemed like they might have panicked, and a chair 
and the lamp and side table had been knocked over, like they had been kicking out in every direction. Unfortunately, they passed away before getting to the hospital. I just stared at him in disbelief. I asked the building manager about it the day I moved out and asked why she hadn't told me. She said it wasn't policy to bring up stuff like that. I don't know if it would have helped or not to be told about it, and I still can't even believe it. You ever gone hunting? I mean real hunting. Deep hunting. I'm not trying to gatekeep the hobby or anything, but there are two different types of hunting, you know? There's driving your ATV out to a deer blind and waiting for 12 hours. Then, they're spending a week in the woods. Two weeks, or more. There's the kind of hunting where you become a part of your surroundings. You become another one of the animals. You don't have to hold your breath and cover your scent from the top of some tower. You're on the ground. You're in it. You don't have to hide from it any more than it hides from you. Sooner or later, you start to see just how much the woods can hide. I think that's what drew me to it initially, those long hunts in the woods. I like to learn about the things the world had hidden from me. I like to see them up close. They didn't like to see me much. I learned that the hard way. I was on my sixth day in a familiar stretch of the woods right at the base of a mountain. I liked returning to my old hunting grounds every few years. This was one of those locations. I liked coming back to see what had changed. There was always a shift in the flora and fauna, even if it was only minuscule. Took me a while to see it sometimes. That wasn't the case on this trip. I knew right away that things were different. There wasn't a jay or waxwing to be heard. In fact, all of the woods were quiet. I didn't know what that meant until the sixth day. On that day, I had my first sighting. There were prints outside my camp. They didn't circle the supplies I had suspended 100 feet away. They circled my tent. The prints were big too, big enough that I almost mistook them as human. There were a few tracks in the soft earth though that were unmistakably canine. The animal must have been dragging one of its legs, creating a longer print. That's what I told myself anyway. I figured it was wounded or sick. I thought it might offer me an explanation. It might tell me why the woods were so quiet. Was the large wolf scaring the rest of the animals away? I was determined to see it up close, in the flesh. I was determined to hunt that beast, especially since it dared wandered so close to where I slept. On night seven, I didn't sleep. I waited. And it arrived. Leaves crunching beneath the weight of something told me which way to look. I saw its silhouette approach first, from outside the dim light of my camp. I thought I saw a man approaching. I raised an arm and lowered my gun. I said hello and waited for a reply. Instead, the shape froze just beyond the perimeter of my vision. I squinted, tried to make out who it was. Then the creature dropped down to all fours and I recognized it immediately. I don't know how I could have mistaken it for a human being when it was so clearly a wolf, the largest I'd ever seen. I had to bring my rifle back up quickly. It was running toward me, running in an indirect and unpredictable path. I missed my shot. The bullet grazed its side instead of sinking into its chest. That was going to cost me. With every step the beast took, its unkempt claws tore up the earth, tit dirt out in a path behind it, tracing the zigzag route it had carved from the trees. I could smell it by then. It burned my nostrils, wet fur and sulfur. Its hair was thick, but matted to its body, so tightly clumped together that I could still make out the muscular shape of its body. 
I wondered briefly if it had hunted the forest to extinction, all on its own. I would have believed it if somebody told me yes. I managed to fire again. I don't know where the second bullet hit. I only remember the creature howling. It leapt into my direction. I barely managed to shove off its attack and turn my gun sideways and using it as a barrier. There was red in its fur. I knew it was bleeding. That second shot had saved me. It was the reason the creature was so weak. The wolf still managed to wrestle the rifle out of my hands as it jerked its head away and pulled my weapon with it. I rushed toward my tent. There was a small axe inside used to trim firewood and cut through the brush. I could feel its breath behind me. I could imagine its long teeth sinking into my neck. I pushed through the flap of the tent just in time. I imagined its claws tearing through the fabric just behind me, barely missing my head. I scurried, retrieved the axe, and rolled onto my back, expecting the animal to be there. I could still smell the odor. I could still hear its ragged breathing. I just knew its face would be peering through the tent's entrance. But it wasn't there. The tent flap was splayed open, revealing the scene outside, grass and dirt. I could see my gun laying on the ground nearby, but there was no sign of the creature. It had left quickly as it came, I guess. My hunt was over. Those woods hadn't welcomed me back. They'd turned me away, and I wasn't going to ignore their warnings. I gathered my things and was gone within the hour. Only when the sun broke, and I finally heard a bird calling in the distance, did I feel safe at all, for one reason or another. The wolf had spared me. I won't be going back to those woods. And whether you're in the blind or down in the mud with the animals, when the forest goes quiet, Remember that you're still not alone. Every strange encounter starts out different, doesn't it? The details never quite seem to match from one person to another. Sometimes the thing they encounter is vicious. Other times it's peaceful. Sometimes it stalks them from the trees and sometimes it runs away. I think that's why the stories get so hard to believe. So very few of them get the details right. They never match. That's the issue for me anyway. Nobody else's story matches mine. Nobody's seen what I saw. Not exactly. Nobody's suffered in the exact way that I have either. That made it easy to convince myself that I'd simply lost my mind. I guess at a point. However you learn to separate your nightmares from your memories. I know what I remember. And I'll tell anybody who listens. Eventually, maybe, someone else's story will sound like mine. Together, at least in the way I picture it. The world will start to consider our tales to be closer to the truth than deceit. If that day ever comes, maybe believing it will make me feel better. Like I said... I've suffered enough already. It wasn't long after I became a newlywed that I also became a parent. It was tough on us. Kids always start tough. I think we were tired, frustrated, and vulnerable. Part of me thinks that they jumped on that. That vulnerability made us the perfect specimens. That's what we were. You see, when the air around us started to hum and the house shook around us, we were their specimens. We were rats in a glass cage. It started randomly. The buzzing in the air was like an alarm had gone off somewhere. We couldn't hear it, but we could feel it. Then the house started to rumble. We jumped out of bed, ran for the baby. When the lights began to flood in through our windows, I ran outside. I wanted to know who was terrorizing us. I wanted to show them that we weren't afraid. When my bare feet hit that grass, however, I was. I was very afraid. A dark spherical craft hovered above our home. A single floodlight poured out from its center, washing across our lawn. 
it fixated on me, like the gaze of some great astral eye. I froze in that beam of light. Whatever that craft was, it didn't have engines. It didn't have any windows for the pilots to peer out of. It was a single solid sphere, and it froze me, there on the lawn. It trapped me like a spider's web. The light consumed my vision. I couldn't see a thing except for that white glow. I couldn't feel anything except for the hum of this mysterious vessel. It shook me all the way to my bones. I could feel them vibrating. My teeth rattled in their sockets. When the light faded and the humming stopped, the craft was gone. It took my mind a minute to realize that the light I was looking at then was, in fact, the light of the sun. The night had ended. I wondered if I had stood there in the yard for the hours between the encounter and the sunrise. When I walked inside my home, I realized that it was worse. My spouse began screaming. They hadn't seen me in days, they said. I was a missing persons case, they explained. I didn't believe them. How could I? I stood in the light for minutes, and entire days were now gone. But everything they said tracked. The date, the police involvement, there was proof of all of it. How do you rebuild trust after something like that? I couldn't explain where I'd gone. They believed me, I know, but they didn't want to. Our marriage fell apart. It was better that way, I know, but it was still impossible to process. I saw my child for a while after that, but then the ship returned. It came from me again. I realized in the second encounter that it wasn't visiting our house that night. The vessel had come for me, and now it had returned. This time I knew better. I stayed out of the light. But its appearance confirmed something for me. I was a danger to anyone I kept close. How could I let someone else be sucked in the same mystery that had ruined my life? My routine became a cycle of doctors and disbelief. I became a warning for the rest of my town. They called me a drunk, a disappointment, or a victim. The name didn't matter. What mattered is that the ship forced them to do that. The ship forced me into solitude, and alone is where I remain. There's no suffering like being alone, is there? It's the worst fate I can imagine. I would have preferred to stay in the light forever, at least then, ignorance would be on my side. Now, I live in fear. I cry at night if the house shakes, just slightly. Bad weather or a strong wind is enough to remind me of the thing I'm hiding from. Not that I could ever escape it. Five times, I've seen the vessel. I'm sure I'll see it again before my time is up. But what does it want from me? Why does it insist on keeping me isolated? What distinguishes me from the rest of the rats? No other encounter goes like this. Not that I've heard. Most happened once and then never again. Mine seems more like a forever kind of deal. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this sounds familiar to you. Maybe my story's given you a little bit of deja vu. Why don't you tell me? Has anyone else felt the hum in their bones? Has anyone else seen the light? Has anyone else lost days, bathed in the mystery of some astral visitors? I know the answer. It just hurts to hear. For now, I guess I'll continue what I've done. I'll remember and wait for someone who believes. Let me tell you about the time I was visiting my dear old mother in her small little house out in the countryside. You see, my mom's house is a small little cottage located on the edge of a really dense forest. It's kind of the place where you can really connect with nature and forget about all the troubles and stresses of our modern world. But things weren't quite the same as they used to be. You see, my father had just passed away and now my mom was living alone. 
it was a tough time for her, and I wanted to do everything I could to help her feel less alone. So, I packed my bags and headed out to the countryside for a couple of weeks, ready to spend some serious one-on-one -on -one quality time with my mom and help her grieve and get back in touch with nature. As I pulled up to her house, the pain of my father's absence hit me pretty hard. He was a really good man, but I put on a brave face and went inside, ready to spend some time with my mom. As we caught up and talked about old times, I got all nostalgic and I felt like I was 20 years younger. There were our old family photos on the walls and the familiar smell of my mom's delicious cooking. It all brought back memories of a simpler time. It was delightful, and I could tell we both needed this time together. And so I spent the next couple of weeks with my mom, enjoying the peace and quiet of the countryside. But eventually, it was time for me to head back to the city. As I said goodbye to my mom and hugged her tightly, I was incredibly grateful for the time we had spent together. I was in a great mood, and I was heading to my car when I saw something scurrying under my car. I figured it was probably a cat's or a possum or something since there were all kinds of wildlife around my mom's house. But as I got down on all fours and flashed a light under the car, I saw the most horrifying thing I had ever laid my eyes upon. Looking back at me was an absolutely hideous creature with green skin, pointed ears, and long, gnarled fingers. Its eyes glowed red in the reflection of the flashlight, and it had these ugly, long, yellow, sharp teeth. I absolutely could not believe what I was saying, and I freaked out and jumped back and fell onto the ground. The freakish green little freak screeched at me and bared its teeth and lunged right at me. It moved with a strange jerky motion like its joints were made of rubber. Its skin was covered in warts and boils, and it reeked like the smell of rotten garbage. The thing climbed on top of my chest, and its long bony fingers gripped tightly around my throat. It let out this crazed, maniacal laugh as it started choking me. I fought back with everything I had. I started punching the evil monster right in its face as hard as I could, desperately trying to grasp for air. Finally, I got a good hit right on its temple and I was able to push it off my chest. It let out an angry scream and took off toward the woods. I sat there on the ground with my hand around my chest, still in shock as I realized how close to death I came. As the creature disappeared back into the woods, I could hear its deranged laughter again, and I didn't know how to mentally process what had just happened to me. I stumbled inside and told my mom what had just happened to me outside. She didn't even skip a beat before saying, It's those damn goblins again. I've seen them around here before. They're always causing trouble. I was in total disbelief. I couldn't believe what was coming out of her mouth. Freaking goblins. Really? This is the 21st century for God's sake. But the more she talked about them, the more I realized that my mom was dead serious. She told me about how they were mischievous little creatures that lived deep in the forest and only came out at night to wreak havoc on anyone and anything they could get their nasty, grubby little hands on. Apparently, these goblins were causing all sorts of trouble around the neighborhood. They would steal food from people's houses, vandalize their property, and make all sorts of creepy noises in the middle of the night. My mom even had an encounter with one of the little devils herself. She told me how one night, she woke up to the sound of something scratching at her bedroom window. She got up to investigate and was shocked to see a nasty little green goblin peering in at her through the glass. 
She said the creature had these beady little eyes and this twisted, evil grin on its face. My mom tried to shoo it away, but the goblin was just laughing and continued to scratch at the window. It wasn't until my mom grabbed a kitchen knife that had jumped down from the window and took off back into the forest. It was all just so surreal. I mean, I always thought the goblins were something you read about in fairy tales or saw in movies. But now, here I was, freshly attacked by a goblin, and hearing first-hand accounts of these little monsters running amok in the countryside. On my way home, I couldn't stop thinking about it. It made me realize that everything I thought I knew about the world was a lie. If freaking goblins could exist, then who's to say that ghosts, aliens, Bigfoots, all of that stuff couldn't exist too? It was a bizarre moment in my life, like this huge veil had been lifted from my eyes, that I was seeing the world in a whole new way. I didn't know what to make of it, but one thing's for sure, I'll never look at the world the same way. If somebody believes in something enough, does that make it real? It at least makes it real to them, right? What about when two people believe in that something? What about when it's ten? Those questions probably aren't doing much for my credibility. I never know how to start this story. No matter what I think, I end up sounding a little crazy. Better to get it out of the way up front, I guess. You can decide now if you're even willing to listen. If you do stick around though, I promise the story is worth it. There's surprise, danger, mystery. Those elements have been following me around ever since. As present as the wind or the sun, even though the creature is gone, the things that followed are still around. The black cars parked down the street, the loud electric interference that cuts into my phone's receiver, the strange men who look in my windows at night. I wish those were the scariest parts. No. By far the scariest thing I've seen was the creature itself. The memory alone is enough to choke the breath from my lungs. I was a stupid kid once, just another 20-something, searching for amusement in all the wrong places. I kept similar company. There were six of us in total, and all of us made the same mistake. We went looking for things that didn't want to be found. We welcome them into our lives, and all these years later, they're still with us. I wish they'd go. The six of us decided one night that we'd break into the old asylum. It was abandoned in the 60s and was scheduled for an upcoming renovation. Since then, they've made it into a hotel. Now, instead of graffiti and urban legends, the halls are filled by tourists and paintings of cities that are prettier than our own. When we broke in, the place was still a skeleton. The story went that something had taken up residence in the hospital. Some claim the inmates never left. Some claim that a monster had come from another realm, lured to the abandoned building by the horrors that had been afflicted on the patients there. The more stories you listen to, the more trippy they became. Each of us believed in those stories. We all had our own favorite. And until that night, we even debated which one was more likely, an elderly inmate who had survived by eating rats or a demon spit into the asylum by the devil himself. It didn't take long for us to forget about all those debates. We forgot about the stories. Urban legends pale in comparison to the real thing. We found scratch marks on a hallway floor. They looked like fingernails. They led us down the corridor until they vanished up against the wall. The scratches simply disappeared at the joint between the floor and the wall. There was a door there once, we realized. Someone had plastered back over it. In all our wisdom, we decided to knock it down. What good is a secret room if you can't find out what's inside? The moment we broke through the drywall, creating just a fist-sized hole, 
we realized that we had made a mistake. Something on the other side screamed at us and an odor that smelled a lot like death rushed into the hallway. We all took a step back, wanting to run, but unable to take our eyes off the hole we'd just created. Then its fingers began to slip through. All ten digits filled the hole at once, moving like erratic legs of a spider, pulling itself from a storm drain. Its long nails dug into the wall, and then it ripped another chunk from the drywall, making the hole just one fist bigger. We still didn't run, not until it peered through the gap it had created and blinked at us with its massive eyes. If it hadn't been for the strange length of its fingers, we might have mistaken it for a normal man. Then it pressed its lips to the hole, revealing to us its rotted and pointed teeth. It whispered something. After that day, the six of us discussed it. We all heard something different. We each heard it whisper our own name. That was enough to make us run. It tore after us. It sounded like the wall exploded the moment we turned our backs. We were screaming and crying and praying louder than we ever had. We believed the stories, sure, but we expected them to stay stories. How many others had wandered into that asylum without encountering the monster at our heels? Did it come to life because we broke the wall? or because we all believed it was there in the first place. We all got out unscathed somehow. Only our emotions were scarred. Our hearts were racing. Eventually, we all returned home and almost immediately agreed to never speak of the thing that we let out of that room. Then the phone calls started. Then the visits. Men with black suits and black cars. I see them still watching from across the grocery store parking lot. Whoever they are, they know what we did. We've all seen them. It's like they're waiting for us to do something again. Or maybe they're waiting for that creature to finally catch up to us all. Some days that's what it feels like. It feels like our belief turned us into bait for something none of us could ever understand. Worst of all, I suppose is that the hospital was renovated. It's a hotel now, remember? And it's pretty clear that the monster isn't living in there with the staff and the guests. That means it got out. That means it could have followed us even further than we thought. That's what they're waiting for, isn't it? It's only a matter of time before those long claws are raking across the walls. Let me tell you about the absolute weirdest experience that my spouse and I had while we were at a family member's cabin in the woods. The cabin isn't even in a secluded area, mind you. It's located near a very popular lake where many people go to relax and have some fun. So we were on our way out of the cabin one day early in the morning. It was probably around 5 a.m. or so. I was driving because I was going to drop my spouse off at work, and we were in a bit of a rush. As we were driving down the road, I saw something huge moving out of the corner of my eye, and I immediately slammed on the brakes. What we saw, we absolutely couldn't believe. It was this huge, gross-looking creature. It sort of looked like a naked, malnourished human, but it had gray, pale skin and its arms were so long that they dragged on the ground. It was so skinny that its ribs were showing, and it was slowly making its way down the road. Its face was sunken in, and it had these terrifying black eyes that showed no signs of life. The thing was massive. I'm talking easily six or seven feet. My spouse and I just sat there, watching this thing, in complete shock. Then, it just stopped and slowly turned its body to look at us. The only way I can describe its face is evil death. It was skeletal and menacing. 
and every part of me wanted to get the hell out of there. But I was so freaked out that I couldn't move. My spouse and I were completely frozen. We didn't even say a word to each other. We were both wondering what the hell was going on and what this thing was capable of. Suddenly, this creature let out this deep, horrifying growl that seemed to be coming from the depths of hell itself. The noise was so intense that it was reverberating through the car, making the windows shake. Then, to our horror, this thing got down on all fours and started charging right at us. My survival instincts finally kicked in, and I just floored it, just trying to get us out of there as fast as I could. We were swerving down the road, the creature following us with its long arms and legs flailing in the air. The sight of that thing running still gives me nightmares to this day. If it caught us, I can't imagine what horrific way it would kill us. Eventually, we managed to put some distance between us and that creature, and we looked back to see that it had disappeared into the woods. My spouse and I just looked at each other in disbelief, wondering what the hell we had just seen, and how we were going to explain this to anyone else. We pulled back up to the cabin and just sat in the driveway for a while. We were both too freaked out to speak. We couldn't begin to intellectualize what just happened to us. Finally, we made our way into the cabin and made sure to lock the freaking doors and windows in the case that freaking thing tracked us down and tried to kill us. We stayed up around the fireplace talking. We couldn't sleep a wink that night, just obsessing about what we had just witnessed. We knew that we had seen something that defied all logic and rational explanation. It was freaking impossible to shake off the nerves that the thing caused us. We tried to calm ourselves by drinking some brandy and talking about what that thing could have been. We passed back and forth ideas, but nothing seemed to make sense. It looked like a freaking ghoul. Before that experience, if anyone had said that ghouls roam the earth, I would have said that they were freaking nuts. But now, I don't know what to believe. My spouse and I were pretty desperate to find some answers after that. We were convinced that we couldn't have been the only ones to have seen the creature. So we started scouring the internet for any information we could find about sightings of similar creatures. But we came up completely empty-handed. There were absolutely no reports of any sightings of a creature that resembled what we had just witnessed. We couldn't freaking believe it. We both knew what we had seen, but the lack of information online made us feel like we were losing our minds. Could it be that it was a cover-up, a conspiracy? My spouse and I were left feeling completely bewildered and confused. We knew what we had seen was real, and we were absolutely terrified as the thought of this creature could still be out there, lurking in the woods, waiting for its next victim. We spent the rest of our time at the cabin on high alert, constantly looking out the windows and making sure everything was locked up like freaking Fort Knox. It was a long and sleepless night, and we were both mentally and physically drained by the time the sun came up. Looking back on what we had seen that night, it completely changed my perspective on everything I thought I knew about the world. Before that encounter, I thought all those ghost shows and all those stories about paranormal encounters were freaking malarkey. But now, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that there are things out there that are beyond our understanding things that are not to be messed around with. My spouse and I never talked about that experience with anyone else because we knew that no one would believe us. We just kept it to ourselves and tried to move on. But that encounter will stay with me for the rest of my life. A constant reminder that there are things out there that we will never fully understand.
Our home is definitely not your typical modern house. It has a rich history, dating back to the 1880s, when it was first built as a funeral home. The original carpet from when the house was turned from a speakeasy to a funeral home is still intact, giving it a unique character and smell. The house definitely has its quirks, and we have had many experiences that cannot be explained by science alone. Some were much scarier than others. My mother-in-law is what you'd call sensitive and can detect the presence of spirits, ghosts, energies, and all kinds of stuff. She rarely leaves the house, and it's not often we get a moment alone. When she left on Easter to visit her sister, I took the opportunity to have a nice, long, relaxing shower. Little did I know what was about to happen. I, on the other hand, was always a more logical and skeptical person. Before I had married my spouse, I didn't have any experience with the paranormal whatsoever. Living in this place has definitely changed my mind about the world we live in. I was showering and resting my eyes a bit. I was just letting the hot water run down me and was enjoying the peace and quiet. All of a sudden, I was standing outside on the balcony of my mother-in-law's room. I was tending to some houseplants while dressed in a heavy, early 1900s style outfit. The clothes felt like it was part of me with its weight on my skin and the fabric brushing against me. I was wearing a hat like a pilgrim would have worn, so heavy and handmade. I could smell the air around me fresh with the scent of spring and I could feel the gentle breeze playing with my hair. It was all so vivid, like I had truly stepped into another time and place. There were horses and buggies going down the road, as well as some old-style Model T type cars in the street. It was a simpler time. The air was so fresh, and I felt this peace and calmness like I'd never felt before. Like all the complexities of a modern day life, just completely disappeared. I could hear people talking underneath the balcony and they had completely different accents and talked in a much more eloquent manner than people do now. It was so bizarre, so surreal. Then, bam, all of a sudden I was back in the shower. That vivid feeling of the heavy clothing and the calming atmosphere just vanished. I was disoriented and confused as to what had just happened. As I was processing the experience, my spouse knocked on the door, asked if everything was okay, as I had been in there for over an hour. It was then that I realized I had no memory of showering. I couldn't explain where the time had gone. The vividness of the experience hadn't left me shaken, and I couldn't stop thinking about what I had just witnessed. It was more real than anything I'd ever felt, and it felt like my entire sense of time had been distorted. Was it a past life that I was experiencing? Did I actually travel back in time? When my mother-in-law returned, I immediately told her about the bizarre experience I had just encountered. To my surprise, she wasn't shocked or even mildly surprised. Instead, she calmly listened to my story and then proceeded to share her own story of time travel. She proceeded to tell me about a time when she traveled back to the time when the house was still a speakeasy. She was working as a barmaid there and described the patrons getting drunk and aggressively flirting with her. Then she recounted how the authorities busted in and violently shut down the place. They beat everyone with bill clubs threw them in the wagon, and as they were shoving her onto the street, she traveled back and was sitting on the couch, watching TV. I was floored by her story, and it made my own experience feel even more real. We had both been given a glimpse into the past, and we were energetically connected to the spiritual essence of the house and its past inhabitants. After my time traveling experience, I was completely open to the spirit world and began to experience paranormal events all the time. For instance, there was a time when I was making breakfast 
and I felt someone shove past me. When I turned around, no one was there, and my spouse was still sleeping upstairs. On another occasion, I was walking past the living room and saw a shadowy figure dart across the room and scream, We're going to be late. We're going to be late. These experiences have become so common that I began to accept them as a part of our daily life. Living in this house has changed my perspective and my life in so many ways. Before living here, I was always a logical and skeptical person who did not believe in the supernatural. But everything that's happened, I realized there's no denying that there is more to this world than what can be explained by science alone. I became much more open-minded and started to explore the spiritual realm with a newfound curiosity. It's gotten me accustomed to a completely different way of living and has made me more aware of the energy that surrounds us all the time. It has also given me a deep appreciation of the history of the home and all the people that have come and gone here all always have a deep spiritual connection to this place. Anybody who considers themselves a non-believer should spend a week here and see if they still have the same perspective. I often find myself talking to the spirits as I'm doing household chores. Man, it's like they are now welcome guests. It was supposed to be a routine patrol, but it quickly turned into the most terrifying experience of my life. I was in my 20s then, still new on the force. When I was asked to drive the route that wound through our local state park, I didn't hesitate. A park seemed safer than the streets I normally patrolled. A little peace and quiet would be nice, I thought. I wish peace and quiet was what I found that night. I was driving slowly along the narrow, unpaved road, scanning the dense forest for any suspicious activity. The night already felt like a ghost hunt. I didn't understand what I could possibly see out there. Busting the occasional teenager who had snuck out of his parents' house to meet up with some friends didn't exactly feel like a good use of my time. Still, I have to admit that the place did look a little eerie. Fog and moonlight were all I could make out in those woods. Maybe I'm remembering it worse than it was because of what happened, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't both bored and a little anxious out there. That's when I heard it. A high-pitched growl seemed to come from all directions. It rattled my windows and sent a crawling chill down my neck. I stopped the car and got out immediately. We aren't trained for that kind of thing. You understand. We're not trained for the weird or uncertain. I didn't know what to do, except step out and announce myself. I pointed my spotlight on the woods and yelled, hoping that someone might call back. The silence urged me forward, even though my skin was itching and my brow was covered in sweat. I needed to know what had made that noise. I saw it. I've spent years wishing I hadn't. It was standing on two legs, covered in thick fur that shone white in the moonlight. Its head was like that of a wharf, with glowing yellow eyes that seemed to peer right through me. Its claws were sharp, and its teeth were bared. I froze. My fingers strummed the leather latch that held my gun in its holster. I couldn't bring myself to draw it. Then the monster lunged. I fumbled for my weapon. It was too late. Its claws tore through my uniform, and I felt it rake my skin. I fell to the ground, still trying to fight back. But the creature was too strong. My firearm was kicked away in the commotion. Plan B was to call for backup. I had to get my voice out on the radio. Then I had to get to safety. I got my thumb on the radio and screamed for help. The man on the other side reassured me that the other officers were on the way. That was good enough. My eyes were frantic as I wrestled the beast's claws, trying to keep it from causing any permanent harm. I felt like I was holding back the jaws of a shark. I couldn't kick back in my car with the monster between me and the door. I needed another option. I was close to the old ranger station. The building was run down and abandoned. 
the result of mismanaged city funding, but there were four walls and doors that I was confident would still lock. For a moment, I doubted that route of escape. I wouldn't just have to worry about the creature above me. The old station was said to be haunted as well. Staring a monster in the face, I was willing to believe every ridiculous story I'd heard about the abandoned facility. The next time the animal cut me, I snapped back to reality. I had to move. I knew that I had to make it there if I had any chance of survival. A lucky kick bent the creature's knee in the wrong direction, and its growl was replaced by a sharp yelp. I managed to crawl on my hands and knees, using trees and rocks as cover, always toward the ranger station. Every time I looked back, the creature was still chasing me, its eyes burning with a strange intensity. I saw its nostrils flexing in the moonlight, searching for my scent, even when its eyes couldn't find me. Finally, I made it. The door creaked open as I pushed it, and I stumbled inside, barely conscious. The station was dimly lit, and the shadows seemed to dance on the walls. Strange noises were already coming from the corners of the room, and the air was thick with a musty smell. It was better than being outside. I reminded myself that the sounds I was hearing were likely coming from the creature, scratching at the walls. I was sure that I was inside, especially after I barricaded myself behind an old office door. The fear I felt only climbed. While I sat huddled in the corner, I wanted to wake up from the dream. What I was facing couldn't be real. Certainly my drive through the park wasn't going to end like this. When backup arrived, I was saved. They didn't see the creature. They didn't see any signs of it, except for the scratches on my body. I was told it was a dog attack. When I tried to argue, my superiors forced me to take an extended leave from the job. I was told to forget about the creature. Otherwise, I'd never return to the force. Why would they do that? I did as I was told. I kept my mouth quiet. When other reports of odd sightings come in, I took the reports, and I ignored them. The rest of the men around me did the very same. Was I wrong for that? What else could I have done? The years have come and went since that terrifying day. It won't surprise you when I say that I still think about it. There are some things out there that are just too strange, too inexplicable even for the people who carry a badge and a gun. If you see them, be careful. Fishing is pretty much my favorite thing to do. There's a campground near the McLeod River in Northern California, where I used to go to get away from everything. It's a pretty secluded area near Mount Shasta. Someone acquired the land up there in the early 1900s and built a fishing lodge. There were also a couple of cabins and an apple orchard. For whatever reason, maintenance wasn't kept up on the lodge and it deteriorated. So it basically just became a remote campsite near the ruins of that old lodge. I liked it up there and could generally have a nice solitary time with only an occasional other person showing up. The orchard had gotten wild and gnarly, with the branches of the apple trees all bent over and arched. Those old trees still produced the sweetest apples, though. There was a lot of long, thick grass that you'd have to walk through when you were hiking up the river. I had been camping there alone for a few days in the middle of the week, and the place was pretty empty. I had gone through the bulk of my food, so I was looking forward to having some trout for dinner. There was a spot upstream where I typically had success, so I headed up there. I was walking through the orchard and was whistling as I went. I always tended to do that, so I wouldn't surprise any wildlife. But then, I got a surprise myself when I saw a black bear pop its head above the long grass and look at me from about 30 yards away. Apparently, it had been lying on its back under an apple tree pawing up at the low branches. It must have heard me coming and set up. It was chewing what I assumed was an apple and looking right at me. It was a very large bear. 
I couldn't really believe it at first, but I kept calm and started walking backward down the trail. The bear seemed completely unconcerned with me. I had encountered black bears a couple of times before and hadn't had an issue with them. I got down to the river and went downstream instead, away from the orchard. I put about a mile's distance between me and the bear. I stayed alert though and kept checking around to make sure it hadn't followed me. I eventually relaxed and got into the fishing and caught two for dinner. I got my fish wrapped up and started heading back to my campsite. I was walking on the trail that was a few yards above the river. There was a part of the pathway that went through some very thick brush. There were trees on either side that created an archway over the top of this section for around a hundred yards or so. It was a twisty part of the path and about five feet wide. There were blind turns every so often. I felt like I was going through a tunnel of sorts. As I wound my way through, I realized I had stopped whistling. I started smelling this really strong scent of urine and I felt like something was following me. My heart started pounding and I felt trapped in that tunnel. Then almost at the same time, I heard this loud howling sound behind me and a grunting, growling sound in front of me. I couldn't imagine what I had gotten myself into. Was I being cornered by two bears? That didn't seem like a thing that could happen. Then I definitely heard some rustling behind me. When I looked around, to my shock, I saw something that didn't fit the description of anything I had ever known. It was some kind of beast standing on its back legs with a massive head like a wolf or a dog. It must have been over six feet tall. It had a humped back and massive shoulders with a thick mane of hair around its neck. It lifted its upper lip and snarled. The fangs were terrifying. Its eyes were yellow and slanted. The horrible smell was definitely coming from that monster. It was only about 20 feet away from me. I was frozen in place. But then the other grunting sound caught my attention again. I turned my head in the other direction, and around one of the blind corners came the huge black bear I had seen earlier. I mean, I can only assume it was the same one. It was about 15 feet in front of me, standing on its hind legs, grunting and huffing. I was so terrified, I couldn't help but let out a loud shriek. I literally couldn't believe my situation and genuinely thought I must be dreaming. My adrenaline caused my body to start shaking. I pretty much just cowered in the bushes and contemplated playing dead, when all of a sudden, the bear's eyes zeroed in on the creature behind me. It roared this incredible roar, and with a giant leap, it charged at the unknown beast with a fury that was incredible to see. It went past me like I wasn't even there. I have never seen an animal behave so ferociously. The other creature immediately turned around and took on faster than you could possibly believe. You'll always hear about how fast cheetahs are, but I swear, this thing was at least that fast. It seemed to accelerate 0 to 60 in just a couple of seconds. I was standing there shaking and was still holding my fish. All I could do was start running toward the relative safety of my campsite and truck. I looked behind me, thinking if the bear didn't catch that thing, it was going to come after me. I was sprinting as fast as I could. I got to the campsite without anything following me and threw everything in the back of my truck with record speed. I tore out of there and just kept screaming. What the effing hell? Over and over. I was traumatized beyond belief, and I definitely have it gone back there, which is really too bad. This happened to me and my grandfather one night a few years ago. We raise sheep in North Dakota, have been for years. It's a family tradition as far back as the 1800s on the same lands as well. We are one of the lucky few who have been able to keep our family land. We had just got done bringing the sheep into the fold for the night. They seemed to be a little on edge. The dogs as well. My grandfather and I stayed outside for a bit 
just to make sure there wasn't something in the area. Coyotes are the usual suspect, but we've seen wolves in the area as well. The sheep seemed to calm down a bit, and we figured they'd be okay with the dogs standing guard over them. We went inside to eat and rest from the day's work. After supper, we sat around the fireplace with my mom and my grandmother, and talking about what happened during the day. We heard the dogs going nuts, then I reminded my grandpa about the sheep earlier in the night. We grabbed our rifles and went outside. We took the ATVs out to the sheepfold and looked around. The dogs were acting weird. They weren't acting like they normally do if a coyote or wolf is in the area. Usually with that, they're kind of excited, but wary at the same time, paying attention to the area that the other animal is at. That wasn't the case that night. The younger dog was lying down in the grass, trying to look as small as possible, howling and barking. The older dog was running around in a circle, barking and whining, and looking back at myself and my grandfather. We drove up a bit to look out at the fields and the stands of trees that were out there. There's mostly open grass around our property, but there are areas where there's trees and brush, you know? I turned on the spotlight on my ATV and moved it around, trying to see anything I could. It was my grandpa that called out, and I heard him fire his rifle. I drove over closer to him and asked what he saw. I have never seen my grandpa scared before. Not once in my life. His eyes were wide, and his face was paler than it should have been. He told me he saw something big, really big bear-sized big, but it was fast, and it was moving between the trees and a small hill just north of where we were. I looked out focusing my light, and I caught a pair of eyes. You could see the glow from my light shining on them. That's when it moved, and I could see what my grandpa was talking about. It was wolf-like, but its head was large and boxier, with a heavier jaw. It moved on all fours like a wolf and it was fast. It started to run, but not away from us. It was trying to circle around us and try to get back to where our sheep were. We drove the ATVs after it, following it with the light and our rifles. My grandfather would stop and fire at it. I'd do the same. We didn't hit it, I don't think, but it would hear the rifle and change its direction. This thing could have easily overturned my ATV my think if it wanted to. It was big, the biggest wolf I'd ever seen. We chased it for a mile, I'd say. Eventually, it disappeared amongst the hills and woodlands that border our property. We stayed outside on watch for another hour, but didn't see it come back. The dogs had calmed down, and the temperature was starting to fall. We decided to head back inside, then call it quits for the night. In the morning, we were missing two of our sheep, and there were strange tracks and gouges in the earth around the sheepfold. Our two dogs were huddled in the corner with the sheep around them. We decided to take the ATVs out again and see what we could find. There was barely anything left. Even the bones were gnawed to death for the marrow. I had never seen anything like it before. Neither had my grandpa. Usually you'll find more after the coyote or wolf takes one of the herd. We've experienced it before, a few times. We found tracks too. Large tracks that resemble the wolves or dogs tracks, but something like three times as big. We continued driving around. Maybe we'd see the things still in the area or find something else. We came up short, unfortunately. We contacted the authorities when we got home. The sheriff came out with some of his men and went over our property. Apparently, we aren't the only ones who have seen this thing. We were the third. Two other ranches have reported the same sightings, the same loss of animals from their properties. Two sheep from our ranch, three from down the road, and one calf further west. All had described the same thing, an abnormally large wolf on their property, stealing their animals, or being shot at by the ranchers. One could have sworn he'd hit the thing, but... We didn't see any wounds on the damn thing. The leading theory, according to the sheriff, came from one of the visiting vets that came to one of the ranches. She thought it was some wolf 
with a strange growth deformity, something like gigantism, a genetic deformity that affects animals and people alike. I don't buy it though. I know what I saw with my grandpa. It bothers him especially. He's been staying out later and later with his rifle, watching over the sheep. I stay with him as long as I can, but if that thing comes back, I don't know. We can't stay out all night. We need to sleep at some point. We haven't had an incident in a few months now. Nothing but the normal coyote or fox, which we've easily scared off. Growing up in the small town of Elkhorn, Wisconsin, I always had a fascination with the unexplained. I would spend hours on end reading books on Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and all that good stuff. I was convinced that there was more to the world than what we could see, and that there were mysterious creatures lurking just out of sight. My buds and I would often explore the woods nearby, searching for any evidence of these elusive beings. Of course, most people in town dismissed our beliefs as childish fantasies, but I always remained convinced that there was something out there. It wasn't until I had a personal encounter with the unexplained that I truly understood the power of the paranormal. I was driving home late at night from my shift at the local diner when I saw something moving in the shadows near the side of the road. As I got closer, I could see that it was a massive, and I mean massive creature, with shaggy brown fur and pierced yellow eyes. Its snout was elongated, like that of a wolf, but its body was more humanoid. I was terrified, but couldn't take my eyes off the beast. They say you never know how you'll react in those type of situations until it happens to you. I can attest to this. It was then that it looked directly at me, and let out an unearthly howl. It seriously freaked me out. I couldn't believe what I was saying. There was no denying that there was something freakish about the creature in front of me. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. A true monster. After that night, I became obsessed with finding out more about the creature. I spent every spare moment in the woods, searching for any evidence of its existence. I talked to locals and researched old books and articles about the area, trying to piece together the puzzle of what I had seen. Over time, I began to hear more stories about the creature from other people in the area. Some called it the Bear Wolf, while others referred to it as the Indigenous Dog Man. It seemed like everyone had a different name for the creature, but they all described the same physical characteristics. I met a few people who claimed to have seen the creature. We formed sort of a support group, swapping stories and theories about what the creature could be. It's since become a really fun group to be a part of, but at the time, it seemed rather dire. As my obsession with the creature grew, so did my fear. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched every time I entered the woods. I even began carrying a weapon with me everywhere I went. Trying to be prepared for any situation, the creature's existence consumed me. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Even when I was at work or with friends, I felt like I had to uncover the truth about the thing, no matter the cost. Thankfully, I never faced any physical harm during my investigation, but the fear of the unknown was enough to keep me on edge at all times. I pored over old books and articles online, looking for any information about the creature. It wasn't until I stumbled upon accounts of people calling it the Beast of Bray Road that I realized what I had seen that night. I learned the name of the creature through my own research, piecing together information from various sources. The Beast of Bray Road is said to be a cryptid, a creature that has not been proven to exist by science. It's thought to be a humanoid wolf hydrid, a type of creature that has been reported in various parts of the world. I never found concrete evidence of the creature's existence, but my research and conversations with locals led me to believe that I had indeed encountered the infamous Beast of Bray Road. 
I learned that the beast is often described as a bear wolf hydrid or indigenous dogman, and sightings have been reported in Wisconsin dating back to the 1930s. While some dismiss the accounts as mere folklore, others claim to have seen the creature with their own eyes. I found it hard to believe that such a creature could exist, but my own encounter left me with a sense of unease that I couldn't shake. After my encounter and subsequent research, I became obsessed with finding the beast of Bray Road. I scoured the surrounding areas, hoping for another sighting or some concrete evidence of its existence. But no matter how much I searched, I couldn't find anything. Eventually, I had to accept that my encounter may have been a one-time occurrence. My encounter with the Beast of Bray Road left me with a sense of wonder and terror. It's hard to explain. But the experience left me with a renewed sense of respect for the mysteries of the natural world. I realized that there is so much that we don't know about the world around us, and it's both exciting and terrifying. My obsession with the Beast of Bray Road took a toll on my personal life. I became distant from my friends and family as I poured all of my energy into searching for the creature. Eventually I had to take a step back and focus on rebuilding those relationships, but the experience will always be with me and I'll always be fascinated by the unexplained. My encounter with the Beast of Bray Road was a life-changing experience that I'll never forget. It's made me more open-minded and curious about the world around us. I'll always wonder if there's more to the story than what I experienced, and I'll always be on the lookout for other unexplained phenomena. The Beast of Bray Road may be dismissed by some as simply nonsense, but I saw it with my own eyes. I may never find concrete evidence of its existence, but I'll always be on the lookout for more clues. Who knows, maybe one day I'll have another encounter with the Beast of Bray Road, or something equally as mysterious. I grew up in a Mormon family and was taught to never believe in anything paranormal. My parents would always warn me against it and tell me that it was just superstition. However, as a child, I loved watching Star Trek, and that love for the unknown and unexplained has stuck with me through the years. Recently, I had an encounter that shook my beliefs to their core. It happened at Bear Lake, a beautiful and serene lake nestled in the mountains of Utah. I want to make it clear that I am still an avid Mormon to this day and full-heartedly believe in the teachings of the Church of Latter-day Saints. With this being said, based on my experience, I know that God works in mysterious ways, and we, as human beings, do not know everything that He has put on this earth. I was camping with my spouse and group of friends near Bear Lake. It was a beautiful night and we were all sitting around the campfire, telling stories and roasting marshmallows. That's when I saw something moving in the water. At first, I thought it was just a fish or maybe a log, but then it surfaced and I saw that it was something else entirely. It was absolutely massive and had shimmering scales all over its body. Its eyes glowed red and its sharp teeth glinted as it opened its mouth. I was in shock, unable to believe what I was saying. The next morning, I went to the local library and started researching. I spoke with some of the locals and learned that there had been rumors of a creature in the lake for years. Some called it the water devil, but due to my faith, I didn't want to call it anything of the sort. I couldn't believe it. I had always thought that these stories were just myths and legends, but now I wasn't so sure. Over the next few days, I couldn't shake the image of the creature from my mind. I became obsessed with learning more about it, but the more I dug, the more confused I became. I found myself obsessively making our tent more secure because of my anxiety. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was watching me even when I was nowhere near the lake anymore. It really freaked me out. Thankfully, we didn't face any physical harm during the camping trip, 
However, the fear and anxiety I experienced was overwhelming. I continued my research, reading old newspaper articles and speaking with locals who had seen the creature themselves. It wasn't until I stumbled upon an old book at the library that I learned the creature's name, the Bear Lake Monster. I was stunned to discover that the Bear Lake Monster had been sighted for over 150 years. There were even reports of Native American tribes warning settlers about the creature in the 1800s. Because of strange occurrences, it remained a mystery. Some speculated that it was a species of unknown aquatic dinosaur, while others believed it was a type of giant sturgeon. In the end, I never did find a concrete explanation for the creature. However, learning about the history and the folklore surrounding the Bear Lake monster gave me a newfound respect for the power of the unknown. Eventually, our camping trip came to an end, and we packed up our things and headed home. I knew that I would never forget my encounter with the Bear Lake monster, but I also knew that I needed to let go of my fear and anxiety. The experience had a profound effect on me. I realized that there was so much in this world that we don't understand, and that the things we take for granted might not always be what they seem. As a Mormon who was taught not to believe in the paranormal, this encounter with the Bear Lake monster challenged my beliefs and made me question everything I thought I knew. Despite my initial fear and confusion, I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe and wonder at the mystery of it all. The Bear Lake monster was a reminder that there are still things in this world that we have yet to discover and that there is always more to learn. As a self-proclaimed Trekkie, I couldn't help but compare my encounter with the Bear Lake monster to the adventures of the Starship Enterprise. It was like I had stepped into my own episode of Star Trek, facing the unknown and coming away with a newfound respect for the mysteries of the universe. In the aftermath of the investigation, I found myself constantly thinking about the encounter and what it could mean. Was the bare leg monster an undiscovered species, a creature from another dimension, or was it something else entirely? While I may never know the true nature of the Bear Lake monster, I am grateful for the experience and the perspective it has given me. It has taught me to keep an open mind and to always be curious about the unknown, no matter how unsettling it may be. I must admit, initially, this experience made me question being a Mormon entirely, as everyone I told this story to at the church originally thought it was nonsense. But instead, it has expanded my faith and my spiritual awareness. I now feel I am on a mission from God to expand other people's minds and bring more open-mindedness to the people in my religion and the entire world in general. I truly believe this is why God has put me on this earth, and I know that's why he made me have this terrifying encounter with the Bear Lake monster. If God put the Bear Lake monster on this earth, then what other mysteries did he put here for us to discover? There is so much about life, our planet, and our universe that we don't know. In my humble opinion, it makes life so much more exciting. My pastor agrees with me, and I now regularly talk about this experience and how it's changed me as a person to all that come into our church. I was living in Dover, Massachusetts, and I saw what I thought was an alien. I was walking home from my girlfriend's house when crossing the street in front of me was a creepy looking humanoid creature with rosy tan skin, large glassy eyes, and a watermelon shaped head on a small stick like body. I was just a normal guy, nothing out of the ordinary. I had no prior experiences or interest in the paranormal or unexplained. I was just living my life in Dover going to school, and hanging out with my girlfriend. When I saw that thing, it changed my life forever. The thing must have spotted me, and it just stopped in the middle of the road and froze in a pouncing position. At first, I thought it was someone pranking me in an alien costume or something like that, but it was too realistic. 
I was seriously in fear for my life, and I was certain that this thing was going to try and kill me. I started looking around for potential escape routes or things I could use as a weapon. The thing didn't move a muscle. It just stared directly at me with its creepy eyes, and I was completely freaked out. We just stood there for a while, and without any warning whatsoever, the thing just sprinted away and jumped over someone's fence. I just stood there for a while, still in shock, trying to figure out what the hell had happened. At the time, I was absolutely 100% convinced. I had just seen an alien and was convinced that the earth was under attack. I called my girlfriend terrified and she just laughed hysterically at me and made fun of me for the better part of an hour. Finally, the adrenaline had worn off and I told her that she was right. I told her good night and I headed home. I knew what I saw but I was just trying to convince myself that it was some punk kid in an alien costume who was pranking me. Then I remember I got that eerie feeling that someone was watching me. And then I looked behind me and saw it again. The creature was crouched over and looking right at me. This time, I was ready for a fight. I was not going to let this little alien kill me. I sprinted at him, screaming and prepared to tackle him just like I took all those other kids down in football. The thing let out this hideous screech and scurried away before I could get to him. And as soon as he was out of sight, I ran home as fast as I could and locked all the doors and windows. After my encounter with the alien, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I was obsessed with uncovering the truth about what I had seen. If I had seen one, how many of them were out there? I had so many questions and couldn't focus on anything else. I started doing extensive research, trying to find anything that matched the description of the freaky thing I saw. At first, my description of the little gray man brought up all kinds of similar experiences with aliens, and I was sure that I was getting close to the bottom of it. But when I looked into the experiences in the surrounding area, that's when I was first introduced to a creature referred to as the Dover Demon. I had never heard of the Dover Demon before, but the description matched what I had seen perfectly. Huge watermelon-shaped head, big black eyes that shined like marbles, and a tiny body with long spindly appendages. I read as much as I could about the creature and other sightings, trying to understand what the hell it was and why was it in Dover specifically. I was shocked to learn that the creature had been seen so many times that it had an official name, and I was confused as to how I hadn't heard about it before. It did, however, give me some relief to know that I wasn't crazy and that others had experienced the same thing. The name Dover Demon sounded pretty sinister, and I shuddered at the thought of encountering it again. The more I read about it, I realized that my experience was not an isolated incident, and there were several sightings of the creature during a short period of time. All of a sudden, it seemed like everybody had a story about seeing the Dover Demon. It was all over the news. All the kids at schools were talking about it, and best of all, my girlfriend admitted that she was wrong and I was right. I had seen something paranormal that night. It seemed like everyone had their own explanation and theory about the Dover Demon. Some claimed it was a lost baby moose. Some said it was an escaped pet given. Some said it was an alien and some said it was an elaborate hoax. But nobody knew for sure what the hell it was. One witness of the Dover Demon really caught my attention. She described a strange encounter she had had with the creature, during which it communicated with her telepathically. She said it had told her that it was not from our world, that it was simply passing through and observing our planet. The witness had been dismissed as crazy at the time, but her story stuck with me and it made me feel a little less crazy. And maybe I did see an alien that night. 
I eventually came to the realization that I may never fully understand what I had encountered. The Dover Demon remained a mystery, and I was left with more questions than answers. However, the experience permanently changed me. I no longer took for granted the things I couldn't explain, and I found myself more open to the possibility of the unknown. I also became more cautious when traveling alone at night, always keeping an eye out for any strange occurrences. You never know what you might find roaming the streets at night. After the whole thing, I couldn't help but wonder what other unexplained phenomena were out there. It was really humbling to realize how much we don't know about the world around us and how much we still have to learn. It's embarrassing to admit, but I was always looking for those things you just can't bring yourself to believe in. My dad told me they were real. He told me a lot of things, and all of them stuck with me. Whenever something odd would happen, or when the details just didn't sync up, I knew what was going on. I knew that one of nature's secrets was involved, somehow. Unfortunately for me, this particular secret landed me in an emergency room. After that, I spent more time in hospitals than I care to admit. It changed my life. For the better or for the worse, I can't be sure. I'm different now, I know that, but I also know the truth. I know that my dad was right. I can prove it if you let me. Unfortunately, no one ever wants to give me the time. I've hungered down in local bars and wandered up and down Bourbon Street, looking for an ear that's keen to listen to the truth. I've found the precious. Now, while I still have the chance, I figure I should tell as many people as I can. What better way to do that than share my story in this way? We had some disappearances in the swamps, more than normal. Experienced men and women going out to do their business, wandering right off the map. Different stories came out for each individual. The police always had something clever to say. There was never any reason to be alarmed. After the fifth one, I was alarmed. More than alarmed, I'd say. I was panicked because I knew what was taking those people. My dad used to tell me a story about the beast in the swamps. I believed him when others wouldn't, as I'm sure you could guess. He said that monster liked to take people. If I knew what it was, I wasn't going to let it keep taking. I went out with a gun and a camera. I was going to shoot it one way or another, bring back proof of the thing's existence. Then we'd see what clever words the police had to say. My old boat wasn't much, but it was sturdy enough to navigate the swamps. I knew where a few islands of mud were hidden in the water. A creature would have to be living there, I figured. So I started to check them, one after another. You'd think someone would have stopped me. Cops would have marked the area as dangerous or something, turned me back around, but no one was out there. There wasn't a strand of tape that I had to cross. I guess if they were posted in the swamp, protecting us from that thing, they'd have to stop lying about the disappearances. On the third island, I found it. Sometimes, I wish that I hadn't. The earth there was higher than the others, drier and covered in reeds. When I approached, I cut the engine to my boat, drifted onto shore. I saw something dark duck into the brush. It was my lucky day. I had the camera strapped around my neck and the gun in my hand. Barrel first, I thought, lens second. There was a chance, I knew that I'd just come upon a cat or a dog, something unremarkable. I learned quickly, that wasn't the case. A roar came out of those reeds, a roar, then a tantrum. The grass split, and then the large shape came rushing towards me, screaming and howling. I fired the gun, tripped, landed on my camera. It's convenient, I know. 
but that's the way it happened. Inconvenient was the way that the creature grabbed my leg. I felt its thick fingers wrap around my calf, one digit at a time. I remember thinking its grip was tight. Then it pulled me into the reeds. It yanked me so hard that I thought my leg might be torn from my hip. I remember my back scraping against the brush and the rocks. I remember the mud seeping into my clothes. It pulled and it twisted. It screamed and it threw me. I rolled across the dirt island until my body landed half submerged in the swamp. My father hadn't warned me about something like this. Suddenly, I felt stupid. Had I really come out here to play hero? Was I planning to bring those missing people back home? I propped myself onto my arms and looked up. Finally, got a good look at the monster while it ran toward me. Broad shoulders, probably eight foot tall if it stood up straight. Long limbed, thin, but shaped out of tight muscle covered in a thin fur. I hate how human its face appeared to be. If I hadn't already felt its strength, I could have mistaken it for a man. I lifted my gun again, somehow, still in my hands, and fired a second shot. I think I missed. Whether I hit it or not, the gun was persuasive in a way that I couldn't be. The creature fled, disappeared into the swamp. It took me an hour to crawl back to my boat. The secret I learned that day was painful. When I tried to share it, the local police and the papers called me a madman. It took a long time for my leg to heal. It took even longer for me to learn that shutting up about the beast would be my quickest way out of the hospital. The more I said, the more they insisted that I was out of my mind. I walk with a limp now. When I walk up and down Bourbon Street, it's slow. That hiccup in my gait didn't come from nowhere, you know. It came from something real. It came from something that only my family and a few others truly believe in. Something no one wants you to know about. Now, at least, you have the option. You get to tell me. Do you believe me or not? There used to be a lot of kids in this neighborhood. I know, because I was one of them. Like me, those kids grew up. They didn't get into law enforcement like I did, but they did all carve out their paths in life, grew old, or moved away. Those kids aren't the ones who are missing. It's today's kids, the ones who shouldn't be, but just are. It's a weird detail to share up front, but the donks in this area have had a tough time having children. I think it's related to our local water or the incident at the soy factory two generations ago. I don't know the truth. I haven't solved that case. Still, just because the born and raised aren't having their own children here, that doesn't mean the streets should be so absent of youth. The kids that move here from the outside of the city all seem to encounter the same bad luck. There's a crisis or a tragedy. Maybe the family moves back from where they came from, or the kid just up and runs away. Maybe worse. It's always something. A few years ago, I thought I was making a break in our small town mystery. I thought I found the kids, or at least what I thought was causing them so much trouble. I was wrong. It was something else and it wasn't being found by me. I was being found by it. The department had received a tip about a boy that had supposedly run away from home. Rumor was that he fled to the area with his father. Whoever called us insisted that they had seen the boy sneaking into an old factory on the edge of town. They used to make glass there. They don't make anything there anymore. The place went under not long after the soy company. While the soy building was renovated, this one was left to rot. Bones of steel and rust, hardly a place for a kid. I followed that tip as far as I could, 
there were signs of people living there. Small shoe prints in the dust on the floor. I called it in. Didn't find anything. But I kept looking. I kept coming back. There was a basement nobody knew about. The entrance was hidden by a collapsed catwalk. I wouldn't have looked at it twice if it wasn't for the voices I heard on the other side of the buried door. Children's voices calling out to me. I called it in again. I didn't do much without letting my peers know. It wasn't making sense. The debris between myself and the basement door had clearly been there for years. No one could have been back there. But I wasn't going to make them wait. I pushed aside what pieces I could. The fire department would be there soon. I just needed to get my hands on the door. I needed to open it just a crack. I managed exactly that. When I did, the basement beyond let out a loud gasp of dead and dry air. It ripped the oxygen right out of my lungs. It was just a crack. It was enough. The voices stopped suddenly. I called out, asking where they'd run off to. I reminded them that everything was fine and that help was on the way. It took my eyes a moment to adjust to the darkness on the other side of the cracked door. Most of it was shadows, shadows and eyeballs, little blinking black eyes, the heads of a half a dozen pelt children all tilted at me like owls caught nesting in a barn. They blinked and they frowned. I cursed, scurried back and practically collided with the chest of the fire chief. I told them what I saw. They got to digging as quickly as they could. There were no kids, of course. Whatever I heard and saw, it wasn't down there. Apparently, they claimed whoever had called it in was just as crazy as I was. There was no life in that factory. I tried to tell myself the same thing. I couldn't escape the feeling that there had been something there. We had let it out by accident. We started getting lots of calls after that. A few people around town were reporting hearing children's voices in their yards at night without any kids in the neighborhood. It's easy to understand why that might have been alarming. We looked. Footprints again. But no kids. None that we could get our eyes on. It was stupid of me. But after a few weeks, I worked up the nerve to go back. I wanted to check out that basement myself. I ducked into the factory, wedged my way through the clearing that the fire department had made. I sunk into the shadows of the basement like it was a pool on a hot summer day. It was cold like water, heavy too. I swam and I searched for some kind of answer. Down there, they saw me again, the blinking black eyes catching the beam of my flashlight, the deep set frowns. I felt like I had intruded on their little clubhouse, the kids that didn't exist. When I reached for one, they pulled away. They shrieked and something about the darkness grew heavier. The shadows seemed to grow and I felt immediately small. I may have well have been a kid myself. I ran. I waited outside for the sun to come up. I waited to see if any of the kids followed. They didn't. Subsequent searches didn't turn up a thing. No one went back into that basement after the official investigation was concluded. The factory was sealed up, legitimately this time. And now I, like the rest of the adults in this town, have been left to wonder, why are there no children here? What are the things we can hear and see in the dark, pretending to be our kids? When I was a kid, I went to study abroad in London for a little while. It was a life-changing experience. I got a job at a pub that turned out to be incredibly haunted. When I first started working there, it seemed like a typical English pub in a small town with some local regulars and was pretty much what you would expect. I got to meet a bunch of cute English singles 
and it was honestly a blast to work at. But there was definitely a peculiar feel to the place. There was a family that lived above the pub, and they used to share some of the craziest paranormal experiences with the patrons of the pub. They had supposedly been living in the building for generations, and had seen and heard some unexplainable things. It seemed like every day they had a new story about hearing footsteps and whispering voices in the night, seeing apparitions of figures walking through walls and feeling the sensation of being touched by something unseen. They even spoke about objects moving on their own, doors opening and closing by themselves, and seeing ghostly figures that would appear in the middle of the night. It was as if the building had a life of its own, and the family that lived there had accepted that as part of their everyday life. As these stories of the paranormal encounters spread throughout the pub, people began to wonder if the family's experiences were just urban legends, or if there was something truly supernatural going on. But for the family, it was just another day in their haunted home above the pub. There was supposedly a woman who had died at the bar years ago, and there was also supposed to be a ghost that inhabited the cellar downstairs. I laughed it all off at first and thought it was just straight up nonsense, but I quickly began to experience some terrifying things for myself. One of the scariest experiences I had was down in that creepy cellar. I was down there collecting bottles to refill the fridges upstairs when suddenly the lights went out and the laundry door slammed shut behind me. I freaking froze in fear. And then I heard these really heavy footsteps coming up behind me. It sounded like a large man, and his breathing was so loud that it felt like it was right behind my ear. I was in shock, and I just braced for impact. As soon as the footsteps stopped, the lights came back on, and there was nobody there. For the longest time, I refused to go down there, but the owner of the place pretty much forced me to, and said if I wanted a job there, I had to go. Being in a foreign country and desperately needing the money, I went down there when he asked, but I never stayed down there long. After that happened to me, I just couldn't shake off the feeling, like something did not want me down there, and I felt it every single time I got close to the cellar. It was like the air was thick with heavy energy and I just wanted to get the hell out of there as quickly as possible. One of my coworkers told me that the cellar had been used to perform surgeries way back in the day. At the time, I figured the less I knew, the better. But now, I wish I had done more digging around. I talked to the family that lived there, and they told me the only way to protect myself was to confront the ghost and tell it that I had every right to be there. It sounded freaking nuts to me, but I was desperate for that thing to stop attacking me, so I decided to give it a try. Despite my fear, I went down there again, took a deep breath, and mustered up all of my courage. I stood in the middle of that dank, creepy cellar, and pretty much shouted at the top of my lungs, I have every right to be here, and if I'm being 100% honest, it freaking worked. The negative heaviness in the room went away, and I didn't feel like I was being watched as much. From then on, I continued to work down in the cellar, even though I was still a bit uneasy. But every time I went down there, I made sure to say out loud that I had a right to be there. It might sound crazy, but it actually worked for me. I don't know what kind of energy or entity I encountered down there, but I'm just grateful then I found a way to protect myself from it. And then, right before I left London to come back home to the States, this hysterical woman in old-fashioned clothing suddenly burst into the pub. She was screaming and crying for help. She was frantic and was definitely running away from something. Before anyone would try to calm her down or offer assistance, she ran right through the freaking wall. It was one of the most bizarre things I have ever witnessed. Everyone in the pub was stunned and just stood there in shock, trying to make sense of what had just happened. 
It's strange how some of the places just seem to hold more paranormal energy than others. And this pub was definitely one of them. I had heard all kinds of stories from the family that lived above the pub, who had experienced all sorts of strange and unexplainable events. But that one took the freaking cake. The lady who ran through the wall and the ghost who tried to dominate me in the cellar are probably the craziest things I'll ever experience in my lifetime. It was a very strange feeling to leave that place. The person who arrived in London was a very different person. I know right away that parts of this story are going to be hard for you to understand. I'm sorry for that. It can't be helped. The details that might make this tale easier to digest just can't be shared. They'd get some people in trouble, you see. As much as I want the truth to be out there, I want to protect these people even more. Maybe that's wrong of me. This is just the best I can do. I hope you believe me, even in the moments that this story sounds unbelievable. I was a police officer in the southern United States for a little more than a decade. For the most part, my job wasn't more any exciting than the average person's. There are, however, a few outliers. The one I want to talk about took place in the summer. It was midway through my career, but still learning the secrets of my job. I was still learning that there are some things a badge can't protect you from. The biggest one, I guess, is Mother Nature. I'd count the thing I saw as part of nature. Only something greater than mankind could have been so terrifying. I used to go into the woods pretty often. In a town like mine, crime always happened in the woods. Kids might throw a party, start a fire. Moonshiners might find a place they think our drones can't find and attempt to brew their own batch of heaven. Others have buried everything from cash to drugs to jewels out in the woods. We've caught most of them. There's never any reason to think that searching those woods might get dangerous. There were criminals around sometimes, sure, but none of them were killers. Our town didn't breed that type of man. Now that I look back, I wonder if we were just missing something. The thing I saw, after all, had certainly been raised in those woods. And I do believe it was a killer. I was looking for a dog. Strangely enough, one of the locals who lived on the edge of the wilderness had reported him missing. Normally, we didn't involve ourselves in that kind of thing. He had been calling the department non-stop. Eventually, we all got so annoyed that we decided to entertain his demands. I was the lucky badge who got sent to his property. Once I was there, I realized how strange his account really was. His dog was old, really old. Wouldn't have wandered far type of animal, you know. He had an electric fence to keep any predators out, not that we had many large ones in the area. One of the wooden posts supporting that fence had been completely uprooted. If he had reported the property damage before the dog, we might have showed up sooner. Can't blame the man for letting his emotions lead the conversation though. So we had an uprooted fence and a missing dog. When I found the drag trail from just outside the fence perimeter leading into the woods, I decided to dig a little deeper. Someone had stolen the dog, I figured. One of those aforementioned unsavory types that must have heard the old hound barking and come to cause trouble. I was determined to become trouble for them. That was my mistake. I walked a deep path down into the guts of those woods. I was in the stomach of Mother Nature and she was determined to spit me up. A crack in the distance told me that something was watching me, something heavier than a man, judging by the volume of whatever broke beneath its feet. I went toward it. That was a mistake. You don't have to remind me, but I thought I was on the trail of a true villain. I was going to catch one of the worst of them, do my part 
to clean up the woods. Instead, there was another crack, this one even louder. It sounded like two trees had been slammed together. A flock of birds flew overhead, startled by the same sound that had stopped me in my tracks. Two more came, quicker, knocks on the tree bark. I wondered briefly if the people out here had worked out a system of communication, thinking that they were warning each other of my approach. I called out, I yelled, I demanded that the cowards show themselves. Maybe the creature in those woods understood me, maybe it didn't, it doesn't matter. There was a flash between the trees. Like a car passing by, I could only make out the colors. I tried to follow the movement. I froze again when a growl swept from around me. It was deep and low. It wasn't an animal call that I had heard before, but it gave me a good idea of where the thing was. I turned quickly. It was twice my size, but still shaped like man. It was looming behind a particularly wide trunk only half hidden behind the tree. Shaggy black fur from head to toe, a dripping wet mouthful of pointed teeth on its face. I might have screamed. I really don't remember. I know I got hit. A stone crashed into my back. I must have turned to run away. It knocked me onto my chest, my face buried in the dirt. I laid there a while, careful not to breathe. I convinced myself that I was dead, doubly so, if I moved, so I didn't. I was completely and perfectly still, until the voice of the local I had come to help broke my trance. I let him help me to my feet. He was laughing. The dog had come back home while I was in the woods. It was a miracle, he said. Sorry about all the trouble, he said. I wrote a report when I got back to the station. My tribe had put a team together to go into the woods to track down what I saw. I was stopped at every attempt. State police got involved. I realized very quickly that I had stumbled onto something I wasn't supposed to. That's why it's hard to tell the story now. I'm sure you understand. Some of the people that urged me to bury this thing, they were the men and women that I worked alongside for years. I don't want you to prove that they did something wrong. I don't want you to go looking for that creature I saw. I just want you to know what's out there. Be careful the next time you step into the woods. I remember like it was yesterday, even though it was quite a long time ago now. I was feeling a bit restless and decided to take a late night stroll to clear my head, as I often do. Living in a small town, the streets are usually empty at that time of night, so I wasn't expecting to encounter anyone. However, as I was walking, something caught my eye and it wasn't just an ordinary sight. It was something very strange, something that made me freak out. It was human-like, but it was incredibly pale, deathly pale. Also, its movements were too unnatural to be human. It was walking on the other side of the road, going the opposite direction. Honestly, at first, I thought it was someone dressed up for a prank or something. Something about it was definitely off. It was creeping down the road right in front of me. Now part of me wanted to turn and run in the opposite direction, but my curiosity got the best of me, and I continued to watch as the creature made its way down the road. It turned and crept around a corner, and I kept a safe distance, but followed it as closely as I could. I had turned the corner, and it was much closer, and I could see it much more clearly. It was about six feet tall, and it moved like it had jello for bones. Its face was blank, almost like it had no features at all. I was in shock. I had no idea what this thing could possibly be. The creature eventually noticed me, and it slowly turned around to face me, 
essentially dragging its limbs around to look at me. That's when I saw its face more clearly. It was completely blank, with no human features whatsoever. Its face looked like it was an egg, but more grayish in coloration and slimy in appearance. The creature turned and scurried off into an alley between two shops. The way it moved was grotesque, and it creeped me out. I stood there for a while in shock, trying to get my wits about me. Eventually, I had to know more about what the hell this creature was. So I decided to follow it, slowly and cautiously into the alley, trying to find any clues or signs of its existence. The alley was dark, and I had to rely on the dim light that filtered through the windows of the shops. As I moved forward, I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, and my heart was pounding, and I had no idea what was about to happen. Part of me just wanted to get away from the creature, but I knew I would never forgive myself if I didn't do what I could to figure out what I was dealing with and try to keep it from harming other people. Suddenly, the creature let out an ear-piercing shriek and jumped up from behind the dumpster. I absolutely panicked as it started violently flailing its arms at me and I could see its blank face, closer and closer. In a split second, I spotted a nearby 2x4 lying on the ground and picked it up, not knowing what else to do. With adrenaline pumping through my veins, I swung the piece of wood as hard as I could right at the creature's blank face. The blow was a direct hit, and the creature fell to the ground, screeching and flailing its limbs all over the place. I knew I had to get out of there as quickly as possible before the creature got back up. I dropped the 2x4 and sprinted back the way I had came, my mind racing with questions about what I had just encountered. What the hell was that thing? As I ran, I could hear the creature's nasty, blood-curdling screeches and could tell it was trying to run after me. I tried to at least knock it unconscious, but I only managed to make the thing enraged. I ran all the way home, feeling like I was being chased, and as soon as I opened my door, I collapsed on the ground, panting and trying to catch my breath. I felt like I had just escaped from some sort of nightmare. I made sure all the doors and windows were locked and secured, feeling like I needed to barricade myself in my own home to feel safe from that thing. I couldn't shake off the feeling of paranoia that had settled deep within me, and I knew that I wasn't going to be able to sleep until I was sure that the creature wasn't coming after me. I got my gun and spent the whole night by the window, my eyes scanning the darkness for any signs of movement. Every creak and rustle outside made me freak out, and every shadow seemed to hold some sort of menacing threat. I had never experienced fear like this before, and I never had since. I was afraid for my life, and the thought that the creature could be out there somewhere watching me made me feel like I was going insane. I spent the rest of the day trying to gather my thoughts, trying to come up with some sort of explanation for what had just happened, but my mind was blank. All I knew was that I had encountered something otherworldly and terrifying, and I couldn't shake off the feeling that it gave me. I was eventually able to emotionally recover from the experience with the creature but I have never told another living soul about this. I know how it would sound, and people would just assume that I was crazy. But this thing was aggressive, and I know I'm not the only person to have had an experience with this creature. My only hope is that the next person who crossed paths with this faceless monstrosity put it out of its misery once and for all. For a while when I was younger, I lived in a homeless shelter in downtown Philadelphia. The shelter was a historic old building 
but it wasn't in the best shape. I certainly don't miss those days. I was battling a severe drug addiction at the time, and I'm happy to say that I've since completely turned my life around. I have a spouse and family, a steady career, and am much happier than I was in the dark time in my life. Now, it pretty much goes without saying that as someone who has lived in a homeless shelter, I have seen my fair share of bizarre, wacko things. I honestly could write a book on my experiences at that place, but there was this one particular supernatural entity that I saw on a pretty regular basis. The first time I encountered this thing, I was walking down the hallway after smoking a cigarette outside, and I got that feeling that people always talk about, the one where the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, and you just know you're being watched by something. Now, I figured it was my instincts telling me that someone was going to try and attack me, or something. But as I was looking around, I saw this black figure down the hallway. At first, I thought it was just a nut who had snuck out of bed, like me. As I got closer, I realized it wasn't a person at all. It was a black shadowy figure with a wide brim fedora and a black suit. He had no facial features that I could see, just a black shadow with a wispy black mist that circled around. I was absolutely in shock and I just stopped dead in my tracks. The man was leaning against the wall and he just stood there staring at me. I was terrified and didn't know what to do. I tried to flip the light switch and turn the hallway lights on, but they didn't turn on. It was just me and this terrifying force in this otherwise empty hallway. Then, after a while, the lights kicked on and he was gone. I looked around the corner and he was nowhere to be found. I turned the lights off and snuck back into my bunk. Needless to say, I didn't sleep at all that night. I racked my brain trying to rationalize what I saw, but there was no denying it was an otherworldly force. The next time I saw it was a few nights later. I was lying in my bunk and trying to get some much needed sleep, but I had the same feeling that something was watching me again. I just kept my eyes shut and tried to take deep breaths and calm myself down but I felt its presence so strongly. I was too scared to open my eyes, but I could sense his presence. I knew he was there. After a while, I finally opened my eyes to look around, and he was standing right at the base of my bed. It had the same wide-brimmed fedora suit and its empty, shadowy face. He bent over the bed and got right up in my face and put his cold hand around my neck. I was desperately trying to flail and scream, but I was completely paralyzed. I really thought the thing was going to kill me. Then all of a sudden, he vanished, and I writhed around, freaking out and screaming bloody murder. When I was asked what was wrong, I just said I was having a nightmare. I didn't want anyone to think I was crazy. After that intense encounter with the black entity, I was on high alert and I was constantly looking over my shoulder, feeling paranoid that it could appear at any moment. I felt like it was following me everywhere I went. One day, I was in the dining hall. That's what they called it anyway. It wasn't nearly as glamorous as it sounds. I was getting my tray and I was walking up to the kind young lady, Jessica, who was giving me my soup. We often joked around, and she was my favorite person at the homeless shelter. It's good people like her that make a place like that and the world a better place. On this particular day, Jessica gave me my soup, and I looked down to make sure I didn't spill it on myself. Then, when I looked up to say thanks, Jessica was gone, and in her place, was the shadow entity, staring directly at me with its featureless black face. 
I screamed and flew back onto the ground, spilling the hot, scalding soup all over my chest. I ended up getting some pretty intense burns, but it was honestly nothing compared to the horror I felt in the presence of the malevolent being. It made me wonder, why me? I've done some bad things in my life. I did a lot of things that I'm not proud of, but I had no idea why this thing hated me so badly. My life was freaking awful at that point. I didn't need any help leading a truly miserable experience. But the only thing that ever made me consider ending it all was the faceless spirit with the hat. I had several more encounters with them, but finally, I was able to get the hell out of there, get a job, and have some kind of normal life. After I left that place, I never had an experience with the featureless shadow figure ever again. Looking back, I really regret not telling anyone about my experiences. I couldn't have been the only one in that place that the hat man was terrorizing. It would have given me some closure to know that I wasn't the only one Mid was happening to, and maybe I could have helped someone else there feel the same way. Maybe it was how old that place was. Maybe it was because all of the seriously negative vibes in that place. But all I know is that I'm grateful I never had to see him again. One night, my friend and I decided to camp out in an old military annex located in central Alabama. It's no longer accessible to the general public, but during its operational days, there were reports of some unusual occurrences in the area. My friend wanted to go hunt for Bigfoot out there. I've been teasing him for days leading up to it, but as we made our way to the site, he told me that he actually caught a glimpse of Bigfoot a week before while he was out exploring the area. The area is probably about four square miles in size and enclosed by a fence with only two entrances. There were multiple bunkers scattered throughout the vicinity and some other random buildings and even some graveyards. We made our way toward the area we were most familiar with. It was situated on a hill and gave us a good vantage point overlooking the nearby road. As we were setting up our campsite, we caught sight of what I first assumed to be a small wolf or an oversized coyote. I had encountered both of those things before, but I couldn't be certain since this animal seemed different than either of those. It was about three feet tall when it was on all fours, and its gray-brown color had me leaning towards some type of wolf. We tossed rocks into the woods to scare it off but it pretty much just stayed still. Usually coyotes will run off at any noise. Anyway, we got our camp set up and it was getting dark, so it was time to go squatching. We set out and probably had only covered about 1,000 feet before we heard a rustling coming from the nearby bushes. We were straining our eyes, trying to see through the undergrowth, and something human-like stepped onto the road. It was hard to see, but we could tell it was standing upright. It was tall, but it definitely wasn't eight feet tall like people say Bigfoot is, so we didn't put it into the Bigfoot category. Sometimes homeless people would squat in the old bunkers and outbuildings in the annex, so we honestly thought we saw a squatter stumbling down the road. He was walking the opposite direction of us and didn't seem to notice us. He got to the top of the hill where our camp was and kept going down the other side. We wanted to keep going, but we thought we should go back to make sure he hadn't messed with our campsite. Our campsite looked undisturbed, so we set out again. After another half an hour, we started to hear what sounded like rhythmic footsteps of a bipedal creature coming from the woods about 50 feet to our right. We started feeling really nervous, so we ended up running back to our campsite, scampering away like a couple of cowards. But when we got back there, things started getting weird. Suddenly, we found ourselves being bombarded with rocks, being hurled in our direction, 
We started hearing lots of limbs creaking and snapping in the woods behind us, and some strange animal sounds started coming out of the woods in this weird rhythmic way. Anyway, we decided we'd prefer to get out of there. So we were running around packing up all of our stuff. Then, on the way out, at the very last crossroads you have to pass to get out of there, we saw something stride out of the woods. It was about five to six feet tall and was covered head to toe in matted, dark fur. It wasn't very tall, but it had these big, bulging muscles, and the stench it put out was overwhelming, like really bad, skunky body odor. Its face was hidden behind a bunch of hair, but I swear I caught a glimpse of these piercing, almost reddish eyes looking at us. It seemed to size us up. Then, as suddenly as it appeared, it disappeared back into the trees. We needed to go straight, but instead, we made a left to avoid passing by that spot, and it took us another half an hour to make it out of that place. But we were really booking it. We stayed completely silent until we had left the area and made it back to my house. I only lived a couple of miles away at the time. My friend was adamant that the creature we saw was none other than Bigfoot, but I wasn't totally convinced. Mostly we were just in total disbelief that we had seen whatever it was. After a little time had passed, by trying to convince myself, I had seen some kind of bear or something. They used to be pretty common around here and people still see them sometimes a little further north. Like I mentioned, I lived about two miles away from the annex. A road was being built that went past my house and led to the entrance of it. A few weeks later, I was sitting on my porch and I started hearing these rhythmic thumping sounds. I started to scan the woods around my house looking for the source when I saw a pair of eyes looking at me out of the bushes, maybe five or six feet off of the ground. They seemed like they were almost glowing in the light that reflected off of them. They stayed perfectly still for about 30 seconds and then slowly backed away until they were gone. I didn't know what the hell to do. I did a lot of research and at the time, it started really making sense to me that it was Bigfoot. So I filed a report with the Bigfoot Research Organization to get a record of it out there. While I was at it, I also reported the thing we saw at the annex. They were telling me this stuff about baby Bigfoots, likely to mess with humans, and that I shouldn't be worried unless I saw a pair of eyes eight or nine feet off of the ground. That didn't seem that comforting to me. I mean, if a baby Bigfoot is around, the parents are probably not too far away, right? Since then, I've moved a couple of hours away from the area, and I haven't seen it since. I have dreams about it sometimes, but I would rather not ever encounter it. I've been a trooper with the Highway Patrol in the great state of Texas for 12 years, and I can tell you, I've seen some things, but this thing that I'm telling you about, it's something I haven't dared to tell anyone, not even my commanding officer. Now our traffic, well, it's not exactly New York level, but it can get bad in the Metroplex. A lot of our highways are like arteries, leading out from the central heart of the major cities. They lead out into a whole lot of nothing, and a lot of my time is taken up with patrolling that nothing. Breakdowns can and do happen in rural areas, and some places are far enough out that cell reception can be downright impossible. And while a car is inoperable on the side of the road, all sorts of things can happen. We're talking running into a human trafficker or drug smuggling, critter trouble, just a normal day in the life if you're me. But the normal stuff isn't why I'm telling you this. The weird stuff is. There are always things that happen in the middle of nowhere 
that just plain don't make much sense. Things like a strange reflective light from out in the dark hills that gives you the willies for a minute. It always turns out to be coyotes or a deer. Or when you come up on what looks like an abandoned car, but the driver's just pulled over to sleep. Not that it matters, because honestly, there's not much difference between a sleeping person and a fresh body for a minute under the beam of your flashlight. These are all things that are normal in the line of duty, but given the circumstances, they still feel uncanny. Every time, just that split second, your heart always thumps and you wonder, what is that? I wondered that a lot one night. My patrol route normally takes me on the highways between DFW and San Angelo in the west part of the state. On this night, dispatch had gotten a call for a car that had gone off the road, so I was on alert for a stranded motorist. Stranded car calls are common, and I always play the game of I wonder what the problem is this time when I get one. Could have been any one of a handful of reasons for the trouble. The most usual one is road debris puncturing a tire. Most people can change a flat, but sometimes their spare was flat too, or so old that it couldn't be used, or the kind of car trouble that needs a mechanic, who knew. Driving that lonely stretch of road, you see a lot of wide open sky and not much else. I remember my headlights punching through the dark, the chatter on the radio background noise that one part of my brain paid attention to while I was focusing on looking for the stranded car. I found it about halfway to nowhere, off on the shoulder. At first glance, it didn't seem too bad. I could tell by the long skid marks that they had slammed on the brakes for some reason, but I couldn't immediately see anything that would make that necessary. Of course, there could have been an animal crossing the road, but I didn't see any blood on the asphalt or any damage to the car. I parked my cruiser about three car lengths behind the stranded truck, lights on, and strobing that blue and red. That's either comforting or intimidating, depending on who you ask and what you're pulling them over for. I had my flashlight on and my hand on my weapon, just in case. As I approached the car, I could see a male, approximately 35 to 40 years old, bearded, wearing a gimme hat and glasses. He was sitting in his seat, hands clearly visible on the steering wheel, which I appreciated even though this wasn't a traffic stop. I waited until he clearly saw who I was and the badge before I tapped on the glass with the rim of my flashlight. And that's when I got a weird feeling. This guy was clearly a local boy, big and strong, and not a youngster, with too much piss and vinegar in him for his own good. He looked freaked out, eyes big and a face that was pale and shiny with sweat. What in the world was going on? When you're a trooper, one of the first things you do is make sure that what you think you're dealing with is actually what you're dealing with. And from how nervous this guy looked, I think I was justified in wondering if this was a setup and there was someone waiting out in the dark to jump me, none of which made my hand move from my weapon, I promise you. I signaled him to hold on with one finger and took a couple of steps away from the truck and back toward my patrol vehicle sweeping the surrounding area with my flashlight. Tactical mag lights are powerful, but I didn't see anything weird in the scrub either side of the road. All right then, I stepped back to the driver's side and tapped on the glass again. He rolled down the window, and the first thing out of his mouth was, did you see it? Not what I was expecting, sure, and I had to tell him no, I hadn't. I didn't ask what made him run off the road. He told me that a blue car, had come roaring out of nowhere, going at least 90, and hadn't taken advantage of the empty road to go around him. It had stayed right on his bumper. The lights had been so bright that he had swerved off to the dirt shoulder to get away from it and skid it out. That was odd, the way the truck was sitting. I should have seen the skid in the dirt, and it should have been stopped oddly, but it wasn't. That weird feeling came back as I listened to his story, so I asked again, if that was the whole thing. It wasn't. He said he'd gotten back on the road once the other driver had gone ahead. His ranch was about an hour away from where he'd originally stopped, which wasn't here. He had driven another 10 miles before he saw headlights coming up behind him again. They came up right behind him, like right on his tail. 
bright, and blinding. I wasn't sure how that would have happened, because there was no real way to get ahead of this truck, get off the highway, and get back on fast enough to catch up with them. Which made me wonder if I had a few bored ranch kids out joyriding and causing problems. I asked if he'd seen enough of the other vehicle to know what it was, so I could call in an APB. I knew it was a long shot because of the strength of the headlights, but figured I'd ask. Turns out, he had. Because the other car had gotten tired of riding his bumper and swerved left to come alongside him. Risky behavior, since he was running in the oncoming lane. But given that, so far, I hadn't been impressed with this troublesome driver's common sense. But I also wasn't surprised. It was a blue car, an old late 50s Ford, which did surprise me. Most people with classic cars don't drive like maniacs. I had to ask if he'd gotten a look at the driver or passenger, and that's when his face went even paler. He looked so bloodless, I worried if he was having a heart attack. He'd seen the driver, but it couldn't have been real, he said, because real people don't look like that. He had to have been wearing a mask. From the description, it sounded like one hell of a Halloween mask, hollow eyes, mouth open, melting flesh, and a permanent scream. Definitely not something you want to see driving alone in the middle of the night on a deserted road, where the loneliness makes even tough country boys think they're seeing crazy stuff. I walked back to my cruiser to call in an APB on a late 50s blue Ford sedan and let them know that the driver had been apparently wearing a Halloween mask before I went back to the stalled truck to see what I could do to get it going again. One tire change later, which the driver clearly could have done on his own, but apparently hadn't want to get out of his truck to do it while he was alone, and he was on his way. I sat in my cruiser for another minute, letting dispatch know that the stranded motorist was no longer stranded. The night was quiet, and the only thing on the road besides me was a bobcat that decided to cross the road. I was honestly surprised to hear the roar of an engine from somewhere behind me. It was a full throttle sound, getting louder and louder fast. I knew I couldn't be as lucky as all that, that whoever was playing tricks on the highway in the middle of the night would be trying this with a Texas state trooper. But then that engine roared, turning into a blazing bright headlights, just like the stranded driver had said. The car, definitely a 1950s Ford Edsel sedan, rocketed past me fast enough that the air displacement rocked my vehicle. I flipped on my lights and siren, peeled out, getting back on the road, and gunned it after that car. It was going 90 if it was going anything, and I had to work to catch up. Fortunately, my headlights were bright enough to make out the license plate, so I called it in to ask for a plate run. It wasn't a modern plate, which isn't unusual with a classic car but is weird if you want to be able to drive the thing legally. Most people pull over when there's a marked cop chasing them. Not this guy. He just kept going, never letting up from that dangerous speed. I was grateful for the empty highway and the open stretch of land around us. I didn't want to think of how this would end if I couldn't stop him. I must have chased him for another 10 miles before dispatch got back to me, that nothing had come up on the plate. The only record they had was over 50 years old. I knew I'd been lucky so far that no one else was driving this late at night, but that wasn't a guarantee that I was going to stay lucky. I knew I had to end this pursuit. I gunned my engine and was able to catch up to the Edsel. This close, I could see that the car wasn't just powder blue. The paint was rusting in some spots and the rear window was cracked. The driver's side mirror was hanging loose. It was a miracle it didn't fly off and hit me smack in the windshield. I could see movement through that cracked rear window, but it was hard to tell because of all the dirt on it. I pulsed the siren again, just in case the driver really didn't get the message, and then pulled into the oncoming lane in order to get ahead of him. It's a risky move, but I didn't see how I could stop him otherwise. I couldn't hear the radio chatter over the roar of that land boat's engine but I was able to pull up alongside him. The side of the car was in worse shape than the rear had been. There were more rust spots, big ones. How this car was being held together was beyond me. I managed to get ahead of him and let him run up to my bumper so I could start applying the brakes for the both of us. 
but he slowed down just enough to make getting around me possible, and then we were back at it. Me chasing him down this lonely stretch of West Texas Road. There was only one thing I could think of to do. I pulled up alongside him and forced him off the road. That Edsel went bouncing into the scrub at the side of the road. This driver given me nothing but trouble, and I was half expecting him to peel out and start the chase all over again. But the car didn't move. I made sure I parked my vehicle a bit behind him. If he ran again, at least he wouldn't be able to run me over. I approached the car with my weapon drawn. My instincts were howling at me that something was way, way off. The night was quiet, except for the pinging of the engines as they cooled, but I was sweating. As I approached the car, I realized I hadn't really seen the extent of damage to this thing. It was more holes than car body, and more orangey-brown rust than powder blue paint. Windows were still dirty and cracked, though I couldn't easily see inside. I shouted for the driver to come out with their hands up, but there was no answer. There was nothing. No noise. Just those cooling car sounds in the background squawk of my radio. After a couple of minutes of a silent standoff, I decided to see if I could see the driver. I shouted at him that I was going to approach the vehicle and to keep his hands on the wheel. As I pulled my mag light off my belt, I brought my weapon and light together. So whatever I could see, I could also shoot as necessary. I swept the light up over the Edsel's body. In good light, the damage looked ridiculous and into the back seat. If I'd thought that the exterior was damaged, I tell you, the interior was worse. It was a charred mess. I moved the light to the driver's side window. I could see through to the passenger side, where there were white cracked leather seats and some weird scraps of cloth that looked like they were torn from somebody's grandmother's cardigan. I moved my light right to see if I could spot the driver. All of a sudden, there was a face pressed against the dirty glass, narrow-eyed and tanned the way ranchers are, with slicked back hair and a style that hasn't seen use in over 70 years. He had been in his late teens or maybe early 20s at the most, and he stared at me with an absolutely dead expression. Behind him, in the dark car, I could see an orange glow start. There was no sign of flame from the engine. I couldn't figure out where it was coming from, but God's honest truth, I wasn't much thinking about how logical this was. The flame grew from a glow to a bonfire in the space of two breaths. I shouted at the kid to get out of there, but he just stared at me through that filthy window. I saw the fire fill the car impossibly fast, saw his hair catch, and suddenly his mouth opened in what had to be a blood-curdling scream. Except there was no sound. When the flash started melting off his face, I was the one screaming, scrambling back to my cruiser. I don't know what I was going to do. And it was still completely quiet. No feel of heat. No roar of flame. No screaming. No nothing. Just a silent Texas spring night and whatever was happening on the side of the highway to San Angelo. When I looked again, there was no sign of the 1950s powder blue Edsel. Just a big scorch mark in the dirt on the side of the road. If I ever figured out what happened, maybe I'll tell you. But for now, I'm still trying to forget everything. After months of meticulous planning and preparation, I finally embarked on my journey to the illustrious country of South Africa. I eagerly looked forward to experiencing the rich tapestry of the country's diverse lifestyle. I had heard of the many exotic creatures that inhabit the land, and my expectations were set high. But never in my wildest dreams did I expect to encounter such a marvel. The sight that greeted me there was absolutely awe-inspiring. A humongous, luminescent creature that stood seven feet tall. Man resembled a fish, but not like one I'd ever seen before in my life. Its bright green glow illuminated the surrounding waters, and the breathtaking sight left me dumbfounded. My heart raced with excitement, and my eyes widened with wonder 
at the spectacle before me. Never in my life had I seen such a creature, and the experience was truly one of a kind. South Africa is a superb place, and I highly encourage anyone who can make the trip to do so. However, do so at your own peril and exercise extreme caution. As I was taking a walk along the Minslava River, I saw something in the water that looked like a giant fish. It was glowing bright green, and it had to have been at least seven feet tall. I was in awe and couldn't take my eyes off of it. As I gazed upon the creature's bioluminescent glow, I couldn't believe my eyes. The bright green light emanating from its body was so intense that it seemed to light up the entire river and the surrounding forest. It was as if a beacon had been set ablaze, and everything within its reach was bathed in this eerie, otherworldly glow. The trees, the rocks, and even the fish swimming in the water seemed to be under its spell. I felt both awe and fear at the sight, wondering how something so mesmerizing could also be so terrifying. It was a sight that would stay with me forever, etched into my memory like a vivid dream that I would never forget. As I was returning from my thrilling adventures in South Africa, I found myself sitting alone at a bar, sipping a refreshing drink. It was then that I met an enthralling woman who caught my eye with her enchanting beauty. As we talked, I couldn't help but regale her stories of my incredible encounters. Unable to contain my excitement, we continued the conversation back at my hotel room and had some exciting adventures of our own. As we lay in bed sipping wine and swapping stories, she stopped me in my tracks with a tale of her own. She spoke of a creature so fearsome and otherworldly that even the bravest men would tremble in its presence. This creature, known as the Mamlombo, had said to dwell in the murky depths of the Minslava River, and its bioluminescent glow could light up the entire river and surrounding forest. As she spoke, I felt a chill run down my spine, and I knew that we had witnessed the same thing. It dawned on me how closely I came to death's cold embrace, and her words stayed with me long after that night haunting my thoughts and dreams, and forever changing my perception of the world around me. Upon finally returning home, I couldn't shake the memory of the Mamlombo from my mind. I was filled with this insatiable curiosity about this mysterious creature, and I knew I had to learn more. I immediately began my investigation, delving deeper into the creature's rich history. With each passing day, my obsession grew stronger, and I found myself consumed with the desire to uncover every detail I could possibly find about the man Lombo. I scoured through old tales, spoke to those who had encountered the creature, and spent many sleepless nights scouring the bowels of the internet to discover what I could about the legendary man Lombo. I persisted driven by an unyielding desire to discover the truth behind this legendary creature. The more I learned, the more intrigued I became, and my quest for knowledge continued unabated. According to my vigorous research, the Momlombo, or brain sucker, as it's so lovingly referred to, is a quasi-reptilian monstrosity that terrorized villages around South Africa and was notorious for its grisly and macabre methods of killing. It would drag its unfortunate victims into the murky depths of the river, where they would drown before the Mamlombo proceeded to crack open their skulls and siphon out their brains and blood. It was a horrifying image that haunted me, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease as I read more about this infamous creature. Its methods of killing were reportedly reminiscent of a European cousin, Duartico, another aquatic monster that terrorized the shores of Ireland. Nonetheless, the Mamlombo was a true predator, lurking in the depths and waiting for its next unsuspecting victim to come along. 
My research of this creature revealed the wrath of a truly terrifying beast that I was glad to have survived on my travels to South Africa. Reflecting on my encounter with the Mount Lombo, I can't help but think about the life-changing experience it brought me. Not only did it teach me to be more cautious in my explorations, but it also opened my very eyes to the extraordinary and often terrifying world we live in. And that woman I met at the bar, how she was like a breath of fresh air, a beautiful muse who inspired a new level of curiosity in me. Because of her, I spent countless hours researching the Monlamo, delving deep into the lore and mythology surrounding this quasi-reptilian monster. And through this research that she inspired, I gained an entirely new outlook on life itself. I learned to appreciate the unexpected, to embrace the unknown, and to never stop seeking out new experiences. So, while my encounter with the Mom Lombo had it gone differently, may have been terrifying, it ultimately led me down a path of self-discovery and enlightenment that I will forever be grateful for.